ATF agent Chris Bayless recalls a time when an undercover operation literally went into the ditch. I was with a riding on another case next to a Hell's Henchman that his handlebars broke off as we were riding together. And I, he looked at me like, help. And I looked at him like, fuck, you know, and I was, <laughs> I moved into the oncoming traffic to get away because I knew nothing was good was going to happen in about two seconds, man. So he's trying to shove the riser back on and he just kind of went right down off into the ditch and crashed. Oh. Like, oh, man. But he had that look on his face like, fuck, you know that, like, oh, shit. <laughs> Handlebars broke. How fast was he going? Uh, we were probably going 40, 45, probably. We were just bar hopping, you know, just riding together. And he was leaning forward. He had a rigid frame chopper with a stolen Evo motor. You know, it just you know, that flex and you bounce on those choppers. So, and he had put some riser up for his handlebars and it just whatever he had welded he obviously was not a very good welder and uh they snapped he pushed them forward he's saying he's trying to shove them back onto the triple trying to get on the triple i was like oh fuck dude you're <laughs> see ya welcome to game of crimes So if you hear anything in the background, that is the sound of happiness for Murph. That is the sound of his granddaughters running around having fun, isn't it? That's it. She's a, she's a hoot. <laughs> she's, uh -huh. also, she's also the princess of the house. Yes, she is. And hey, by the way, welcome back. Game of Crimes, Morgan Wright here, the ultimate host of the interwebs with my literal partner in crime. Steve Murphy, everybody calls me. You know what you call me. Please don't call me asshole. Murph. <laughs> Murph. Uh, they're synonymous. Hey, by the <laughs> way, too, people are going to wonder why I'm mentioning this, but it's going to factor in here in a minute. So, Murph, in case people have forgotten, tell us about your two daughters. Well, uh, as most of you know, and those of you that are about to learn, my daughters are Colombian by birth. So my wife and I adopted them when we were stationed at Bogota, Colombia, back in the mid-1990s. Uh, Monica was eight months old. She's just had her birthday, just turned 29, getting ready to turn into an old lady next year, she thinks. And Mandy is from Medellin. She was five months old. We got her. She's 28 years old. So, uh, and there's a reason. There's a method to our madness here. So we're going to hold on to that when we tee up the next episode. But for now, everybody, welcome back. Thank you guys for joining us. Once again, just a little bit of housekeeping before we dive into the really good stuff. Head on over to Apple, Spotify, hit those five stars, Cinco stars. They mean a lot to us. They actually help us out quite a bit. And I can tell you too, we track our numbers, you know, daily and weekly, and we're starting to see the impact of what you guys are doing for us. And I just want to say thank you, because we'll talk about Steve Smith's episode here in a second. But those things really help us out. Head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com for everything. we got our book list there. So all of our episodes where people have written books, the people on the episode, if they've written a book, we put it there. The last one was Bill Sarukas, Chasing Evil, you know, stories from the U.S. Marshal Service. So that was a great episode. Other than uh, Marlon, one of our guys, he, he ordered it from Amazon. It was the book cover, but it was the wrong book underneath. <laughs> <laughs> now that sounds, I told him that's like Murphy's Law kicking in. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, we had to do a fugitive hunt, had to get the U.S. Marshals to track down his book. But nor, thankfully, he did that. Also, follow us on the social media, at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook, and on the Instagram. But definitely where you got to be. And right before we started recording this, one of our Patreon fans and our regular fans, Andrea Papa George, came on. We just released an episode called You Can't Make This Shit Up. <laughs> and we got so <laughs> many comments about that. Just some, all it was was just funny stories from the internet. And Steve, this is one of our most, I mean, commented on episodes we had in a while. That one and the 911, What's Your Emergency? So I think we've got a couple winners here. What do you think? Oh, man, I'm loving it. And I got to tell you, man, I just got back today from uh, up in the D.C. area. I had the, the honor and the pleasure of going up to speak with students from Northeast, Northeastern College, New England College. Jeez, I can't even remember what the hell I was. It was just yesterday. I just got back today. New England College. This is the uh, second year I've promoted these guys and been with them. And their bus driver, because they, they, their college brings them down, they go tour all this stuff around the D.C. area, all related to criminal justice and law enforcement. Their bus driver is a retired police officer. He came up to me. This is unsolicited. He came up. He said, man, I love that podcast. You got Game of Crimes. I'm like, really? You listen to it? 
He said, dude, I travel. Some of my trips are six to seven hours. You guys get me through these bus trips. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to say his last name, but Steve, thanks for being a patron for us, brother. We really, really appreciate it. And, and actually one other quick thing too, you were down at the DEA Academy and how small is this world? You ran into the son of a guy that I was on a police department with and the state patrol with. Yeah, and he came up to, we got to meet, uh, there's two classes of, of basic agent trainees going through the academy right now, and, and we got to meet one of the classes, and the guy, I met him in the hallway, and I, he said, uh, uh, hey man, I, you know, I said, where are you getting stationed, all that stuff, and I said, were you a police officer? He said, yeah, I was a Kansas State trooper. I said, no kidding, my podcast co-host was a, a trooper also. We hate him as much as we hate you, and, and you know, just kind of laughing around, <laughs> and he said, what's his name? And I said, Morgan Wright. He said, I know the guy, he worked with my dad. So it is a small world. <laughs> so Doug Carr, here's to you. Here's to your son. Hey, good luck there in the basic basic agent trainee bat class, the bat belt. Anyway, we kind of went off topic, but that's where Patreon takes us, right? So the other thing too is go to uh, patreon.com. You can also, uh, Game of Crimes, uh, just hit hit us up there. Also paypal.me slash Game of Crimes. If you just want to throw something our way, we really appreciate it. Now, Quick disclaimer about the show. We're going to have some fun here, but it is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We do take the story seriously, but... You know we never take ourselves serious. I mean, hey, we're having fun here already. It's going to be a good one. And before we get into it, Murph, guess what time it is? It's not daylight savings time. What time is it? (laughs) It's time for... Small Town Police Blotter. Faster, man. Faster, faster, faster. Small Town Police Blotter. Small town okay, police there you go. Small town police blotter. <laughs> hey, by the way, I got something to throw at you. I'm going to have a fun one at the end instead of doing what year was it or the other stuff. I got something cool that uh, one of our folks sent in. I'll tell you that. But the first one, Steve. Oh, Lord. <laughs> here's the first one, though. This comes to us from Ohio, right? And you, we've all heard the saying like, hey, you know, he was caught in a pickle or in baseball it's called the pickle, right? So you're caught in a pickle, you know? Right, right. So Ohio, is Ohio motorist in a pickle after cops find drug stash in his car. Now you're thinking... Is that just a headline, or does it have something to do with the story? Stay tuned. An Ohio man is facing drug charges after police found a large amount of marijuana and THC wax in his car during a traffic stop. Antonio Stanley, a 40-year-old Cincinnati resident, was busted on felony trafficking possession counts after after he was pulled over on Interstate I-75. He is seen, uh, along with a narcotics cup, cop sees drug paraphernalia, cash, a phone, and an individually wrapped Freestone Dill Pickle. <laughs> According to the Bangor, Maine, or Bangor, Michigan-based Freestone Pickle Company, its products are a great salty snack alternative that are low in calories, fat, and cholesterol-free. The confiscated <laughs> pickle has an estimated street value of about one buck. <laughs> well, I guess if you get some munchies, you know, you got something right there on hand. Good grief. Got the pickle. Oh, why'd you, why would you seize the pickle? <laughs> Where are you going to store that puppy? <laughs> I don't know, man. But uh, he was apparently he was in a pickle, pickleless, no more. Well, you know, so, well, he is put, pickleless. If they store that in the department refrigerator, somebody's going to eat it for their lunch. Yeah, there you go. Concealing evidence. We have another charge now. Well, but you know, you can rec- recover that evidence, and you know how you recover it. We ain't going to do it. We ain't going to go there. No, <laughs> had to do that once. Never again. Oh. So anyway, moving on. Next one comes from Old Town, Idaho. Steve, population. 221. Wow. Salute. Salute. So guess what, Steve? (laughs) Yes, sir. Deputies responded to a report of a gaggle of elk loitering in a public roadway, creating a traffic hazard near milepost 33, Highway 41 in Old Town at 1.23 a.m. Deputies spoke with the elk, and they agreed to leave the roadway (laughs) and not return. (laughs) Okay, I got a couple questions here. One, what's a gaggle? How many is a gaggle? Well, tech, it's, I'm funny you should ask that because I did some research, and according to the U.S. Geological Survey, it can either be a herd of elk or it is also called a gang of elk. It is a gaggle of geese. It is not a gaggle of elk, so they got the story wrong. Oh, we got to do a retraction. Retract no, we're not doing story. a retraction. They just got to they just got to edit the story. But anyway, well, the second question is how do you how, what do you say to an elk? I don't even know it's moo. All I can do is talk Kansas cow. Moo, (laughs) moo. Move along, people. Anyway, hey, this one, this was pretty cool. I thought instead of doing what year was it, Steve, we're going to do a blast from the past. This comes to us from Jay Visconti. He gave it to us on our Game of Crimes fan group. So, Steve, we all know what bolos are. You know, they're not ties, right? They're beyond the lookout. So when we issue a bolo, we're looking for something. 
Actually, this is what year was it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this to you, and I want you to give me an approximate <laughs> year you think it was. Okay. This comes from the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, the Detective Bureau, Washington, D.C., June 25th. Look out for and arrest for murder committed in this city about 5 p.m. Thursday, June 23rd. Frank William Funk, a white man, may register at second or third class hotels as Harry A. Nicholson or Wilson, 23 to 25 years old, 5 feet, 8 inches high, 185 pounds, light hair, no beard, sunburned complexion, deep set gray eyes, large Roman nose, India ink mark FWF inside one forearm, clasped hands in India ink inside other forearm, works as a carpenter, education, poor, dressed when he left here on Thursday evening, June 23rd, in a new blue serge sack suit, black bone buttons, half lining size about 38, <laughs> has on new number nine shoes, new shirt and necktie, new number seven hat. Funk entered the house of William H. Brooks, whom he killed with an ax and attempted the murder of Ms. Brooke, Mrs. Brooks, who may die. Funk took about $100,000 or $1,000 from the person of Mrs. Brooks and escaped. Police have diligent inquiry made and sending information to J.W. Mattingly, Inspector Detective Bureau, and William G. Moore, Major and Superintendent of the Metropolitan Police. What year was it? Well, I got one question first. So if he's if he registers in class two and three hotels under one name, what does he register what name does he use if he goes to a class four or class five hotel? Unknown. Well, well Fanula New. Fanula New. <laughs> what year was it? Nineteen fifty six. And you are way off. Yeah. Eight, eight, June twenty fifth, eighteen ninety eight. Good lord. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't even in the same safe century there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't, man. Holy cow. You talk about detail, though. Wow, that's a lot of attention to detail. Now, before we get into our next episode, let's just do a quick recap. Uh, Steve Smith, uh, Toronto Police Service, came on, gave us a fascinating yeah. cold case. Uh, and, you know, it's just kudos to those guys. 36 years, and they solved this case. And, Steve, two, two important uh, records. I want to talk about number one. This was the second most downloaded episode we've had since last September. Wow. And second of all, because he got the Canadians ass in gear, Canada has moved up one notch now. They are ahead of Australia. I saw that. I looked at that this morning. And so kudos to you, Steve, man, you kicked ass on this one, boy. I tell you. Brought it home, homie. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Way to go. Well, anyway, that was a quick aside. But anyways, guys, we thought that was a great episode. Steve did such a great job on that. And as we always do, we always bring people who do great episodes. And this one is no different. In fact, we, as we found out, this one that we're going to talk about with Chris Bayless, legendary undercover ATF agent, mm -hmm. we had one story from Lou. Then we got a story from Jay Dobbins, Jay Bird, which we confirmed. And then we were asking Chris about it. Come to find out, Chris was there. It's the infamous... Stripper hits Jaybird in the face <laughs> episode. It is. It's hilarious hearing the whole story. But you know what? The, and here's the thing. I mean, you you folks have already heard Lou and you heard Jay tell their stories. And let me tell you, those are two studs. You've seen the pictures of them. They look like freaking motorcycle guys. They scare the crap Spions out of me. Spions of Satan, as they say. Yeah, you're not kidding. But you know what? They both talk about Chris Bayless, I guess, today. As if, he, as if he's a, a walking superhero and a legend. I mean, th these guys would bow down to Chris. That's how much respect they have for this guy. And Chris, you're going to hear a story here. One of the most humble people. He has his beliefs and he stands by what he believes, which I think is fantastic. You know, I, I was just talking to uh, these college kids a couple of days ago and told them, you set your standards, you live up to your standards. Don't change your standards for somebody else. And he's going to tell you about some things that he's done. And you know what? He just doesn't put his opinion out there. He supports it with facts. So I love the way Chris has done this interview. Fantastic, buddy. And we're going to get into it because that's the reason. So method to our madness, there's a reason I wanted to talk to you about Murph and his daughters because, you know, they're both Colombian. They're both adopted. At the end, in part two, you're going to hear us get into a discussion. And I just want to prep everybody right now. Take your trigger fingers off your triggers. We're having a really good discussion with based on facts. So don't anybody go get uh, upset about this. This is just us bringing out really, I think this is one of the most serious discussions we've had with somebody. And I can't wait to get into it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I just, uh, you know, I love it when people call me a racist, <laughs> especially if I'm racist against Latinos or Hispanics. I'm like, you should have done your research before you said that. You don't know about my daughters, do you? 
Yeah. Well, one way to find out what's going to go on then, Murph, let's get into it because I have to ask you, are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, least racist, most dangerous game of all, (laughs) the game of crimes? Yeah, baby. Hey, everybody get in, sit down, shut up, hold on and learn. Bring on Chris Bayless. Here's Murph again being real funny as we're introducing the episode, but it's he never has anything original <laughs> except me. I'm the original one here. All right, guys. Hey, this is going to be a fun episode here um, because we have yet another member of BATFA, also known as the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, <laughs> Firearms, and Explosives. <laughs> BATFA. <laughs> BATFA. <laughs> BATFA. And uh, so, hey, man, let's welcome uh, Chris Bayless, retired ATF, buddy. Welcome. Woo-hoo. Thank you very much, man. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here with you guys, man. Thank you. You say that now. Wait till the podcast is over. Right. Isn't this, as we say, this may change. Yeah. <laughs> this is our honor to have you on here. We've interviewed some, uh, some of your colleagues in the past, as well as the state local, Steve Cook. Uh, everybody talks about the Chris man. So getting you on here, this is a huge win for us. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank there. you guys. You know, it's very nice of those guys to say there's uh, I stand on the shoulders of some, some giants. Uh, there's there some great guys, man. No doubt about it. Well, do, Lou, do you I wear a kilt? Do you have underwear on under that kilt? Or I do. When you stand on their shoulders? I do. Okay. I do. <laughs> then you're not wearing the up. kilt correctly. A lot of them look then up. You're, <laughs> then you're not wearing the kilt correctly. In kilts, you go commando. <laughs> yeah, there you, go. Well, you know, and Lou, I mean, I, I think we all know you You kind of carried Lou. You know, he rode your co- coattails. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. He's that gets right sick. out of central casting, man. I mean, if you want to like, okay, is, who's a he? badass, thuggy looking, sleeved out, tattooed. I mean, those guys go in anywhere and they, in J2, man, they immediately, and we've got a lot of guys like that, that just, they command respect the minute they walk into a place. I go into a place, they generally look at me, they hand me their car keys, you know, can you valet this <laughs> around the corner? You know, I, I don't have the same vibe as those guys. So I always tell them I have to work a lot harder. I, you know, and, and the, the things that we say about them, we say in jest that we love them, they're brothers, but all three of them, so Jay, Lou, and, and Cookie, all three talked about the Chrisser. Yeah, so you're that's... being very humble here. And again, it's just, it truly is an honor to have you hey, on here. Hey, you so know who thanks. else also blended well into the background, but was a master sleuth? Who? Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> Nobody, he was smart like a fox. <laughs> that's what it is. That's it. <laughs> so she was seeing this and did a boop on her head. Yeah. <laughs> does she boop? Does your dog bite? Yeah. No, I th- boop. Not but you dog. said your dog does not bite. That is not my dog. That's right. We've all seen the same <laughs> yeah. movie. Peter Sellers, he is, Chris is the Peter Sellers of ATF. Obviously, so, uh, we we're, just, we're gentlemen of a certain age that, uh, uh, that yeah, we can pull that out go. and pick back. And, and, and next it will be Monty Python. <laughs> so, but we'll, <laughs> hey, before we get too far into that, uh, sure. that does speak of a certain age, let's talk about as we always do. And look, I want to clear up something. There's some folks out there that say, hey man, the first like, you know, 50 or 60 minutes was just, you guys were just yapping about this and that. I said, well, no, there's always a structure to this. We, you know, we have found one of the most important things is you got to get to know the person to understand the operations. And so we spend the the kind of the first part, we always divide this into four parts, four parts. The first one is Why'd you get into law enforcement? And sometimes your background, Rich Moraz, Steve, when we talk with Rich from LAPD, it was having his father commit suicide and having his uncles there from LAPD. That, that's what that's what charted his course. Same thing with Dominic Polifron, you know, with Dave Riker, you know, so we've we always want to set context to get you to introduce. By the way, one of the great things was, guess who we just had on? You know, our famous, uh, our favorite uh, CIA person, Tracy Walders. She was CIA and FBI. But unless you knew that she was at USC, started off in a sorority, um, <laughs> and just by chance gave her resume to a CIA recruiter, the story wouldn't have as much impact. So we always try and say, why'd you get started in this business? What formulated it? Then we start setting context for what we're going to talk about. And we've got three things we're going to talk about with Chris today. And then we're going to talk about the actual cases. And then we work on what are you doing now? So for those folks out there, just wanted you guys to understand is that it's not just, we're, we're just not wasting time in the first you know, 40, 50 minutes. It's really getting to understand the person. So uh, Chris, we've already got you figured out. Basically, everybody <laughs> wants to be Chris. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. What's next? Yeah. For Halloween is when they want to be for- me. It's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, no, I, 
you know what? I, I had, uh, you know, getting started in the game here. Um, I had, uh, I'd gone to college. My bachelor's degree is actually in biochemistry and say what? Yeah. <laughs> biochem and environmental studies. And then, um, so you were going to be, you were going to be a meth dealer. You were going to cook meth. Correct. Exactly. I just needed precursor chemicals and that's all I was doing. So I and was, yeah. They up and made breaking bad. That should yeah, have been exactly. about you. They stole my it, thunder. I was out. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> hey, so, but let's talk about, but, but you say you grew up in Illinois, Chicago area most of your life, right? Yes, I did. Sure did. Yep. Yep. Suburbs of Chicago. Uh, my parents were both uh, school teachers. They were, uh, let's see, uh, my mom started in 64 back under the Head Start program. She got hired up here as part of that uh, war on poverty, war on, you know, whatever the, the latest war was back then. Uh, poverty, I think it was uh, education. And my mom was big into that. She's an awesome teacher. My father was a science teacher. Um, and that's kind of how I grew up. My dad worked construction on the side. That's how he made his money. So uh, I did side jobs pretty much since I've been in fifth, sixth grade, you know, working with my dad. So that helped me a lot with the undercover persona that I used later on, uh, being able to, to do all that stuff. It really helped. So it was a nice skill set to have, uh, to be able to, you know, I could do pretty much, you know, it's not the greatest, but, uh, you know, I plumbing, electrical, you know, room additions, all that stuff. I, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. And I've been doing it all my life. So that's kind of how I started, uh, like growing up, uh, the guys I hung around with just good friends, you know, in Chicago, they always say there's, there's an ancestral relationship for every neighborhood, you know, especially on the South side. So, uh, you know, everybody's about four degrees of separation. My wife is from Pittsburgh and she goes, there's nothing else like this in the country like chicago it's always like if you know you've a never guy, been to west virginia where murph is from have is you? that pretty much the same <laughs> yeah kind of <laughs> like yeah, two degrees straight, of separation yeah, right. family trees that look like a straight limb well chicago's all about parishes so whether you're protestant or catholic it's what parish well you buy tommy moore did you grow up in the tommy moore neighborhood yeah all right then yeah. you know this guy this guy this guy yeah i do you know, oh no so. there's a much bigger question you got to ask we got to answer early on mm -hmm. cubs or socks that's exactly oh socks please <laughs> No kidding. I, if, if, you know, I, if I want to watch a Little League game, I'll go over here and watch the kids. Ooh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you All heard right. about the guy, the Chicago Cubs fan that died, and he said his last wish was to be uh, carried at Paul Bears. He wanted six of the Cubs players. Wow. You know why? He wanted to be let down one last time by the Cubs. <laughs> right. Yeah, that seems about right. But yeah, insert oh, your man. favorite team in there. All right, so we've uh, we've established you're a true Chicagoan. Chicago. Yes, that's right. Yeah, Correct. Chicago. Yeah. So and the Bears, obviously, because there's no other professional football team there. But that's uh, right. That's right. Are you a Bears fan? Of course. Although, of course. you know what, the whole after a while, when the baseball went on strike, I kind of fell out of favor with them. The whole football thing anymore with the kneeling, I kind of, you know, I just I kind of I took a pass from it for a while. So but, yeah, traditionally, definitely a, a Bears fan. True. You know, the, the professional sports are getting so crazy. You know, they're making this buttload of money for playing a freaking game. And it's a little kid's game, guys. You know, it's not you're not curing cancer or freaking, you know, yeah. nobody saved the world yet. You know, it's a, it's a but the, the so, spectators uh, are paying a buttload of money to go watch it. It's, it's exactly. getting to the point where I can't afford to go anymore. No, yeah, it's a fact. Uh, that's that's why I only go to God's teams, the games for God's team, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. <laughs> oh so. boy, here we go, right out. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See, oh, now that shit. has a long storied history around Chicago too, because where did Rudy come from? Yeah, Rudy. In fact, well, I hate to tell you this, but I think one of the Rudys actually, it might have been that one, went to jail for tax evasion. There so you go. he had some business issues. Later no, on not that Rudy. Way. Not my <laughs> no, Rudy. Not your no. Rudy. No. Uh, not my Rudy. No. That was another Rudy. No, not the guy that was carried up on the. Yeah. <laughs> not Rudy Rudiger. No, that that must have been the bad Rudy. That, that must have been somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, by the way. Uh, uh, has there been a governor in your lifetime in or in Illinois that has not gone to jail? Not that I can think of. We actually, <laughs> Illinois is the most corrupt state in the union. I mean, it's in, I think Chicago proper is probably the third most corrupt city in the country. Uh, well, how yeah. many times are you legally allowed to vote in an election in Chicago? As many times as you can go back around and get back in line. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Hey, it's consistency and tradition. You know, yeah. you don't want to break tradition here. We just indicted probably the guy that's been running the state of Illinois, a guy named Mike Madigan, just recently got indicted by the feds. 30 years of corruption. And it's so funny because all the other Democrats seem to think that he just operated in his own bubble and he affected nobody else. No other Democrat was affected by Mike Madigan that basically ran it for the last 30 years. Well, now he's going to jail. And, you know, my little shout out, shout out to all the other Democrats that think they're untouchable. I think there's a lot more coming down the pike. People. Your turn's coming. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So we got to be careful. I mean, you are allowed to do it. Murph, 
we we stay you know we are neutral here we're the swiss we're apolitical so no, we, totally make fun, we make fun of all of all politicians yeah we do but and trust me well and like well, I said there's uh, enough but, to go around uh, there, oh, there's yeah. enough but i tell you the the most the most comical one was rod blagojevich where he said his hairbrush he wanted people to treat that like the nuclear football somebody <laughs> always had to have his hairbrush <laughs> <laughs> you know my son actually met him he was my son and and my daughter were pages down at the uh, legislature at, uh, they went to a legislative um, during when they were in conference. They went down there and he met. They met Bogoyevich, and Bogoyevich fancies himself as quite the history buff. My son was probably 13 at the time, is a great history buff. So they had a history competition, and the the governor said, "You know what? If you win, you beat me, then you can spend the night in the governor's mansion in Springfield." So my son asked him a question. He goes, "Who's the only president to ever be arrested?" And it stumped him. He's like, "I don't know." And I think it was. Uh, not, uh, who's the union um, uh, grant he was arrested for speeding on a horse you know in <laughs> downtown dc or something <laughs> so he actually true to his word he let him spend Probably it so my, speed my, they had speed cameras for horses back then who knew yeah my son and uh, my daughter got to spend the night at the governor's mansion that but that was before he went to jail so that was nice that that's was cool nice. man that's cool yeah. now you're so you're you have a son and a daughter right yes sir. Other yeah. kids. yep Yep, and and they have they probably have some specialized training that most children don't grow up with, don't they? <laughs> you know, it's funny we we talked about that a little bit before, and it's <laughs> yes, we you know, did. It's so don't tell me tip, a story. You know, it's coming back. <laughs> it, it's uh, it's just kind of typical. You know, I'm divorced, obviously, in law enforcement. That's you know, kind of the nature of the beast sometimes. So when I got divorced, my kids were super young. I lived in an apartment, and I had no money to go out and do anything. So I was on a SWAT team at the time. So. Um, with nothing else to do, my son was and my daughter were kind of like playing with my SWAT gear. I had my kit and all my stuff there, so they would put it on and stuff. So they're like, "Hey, Dad, let's uh, let's let's do some let's do some warrants," you know. And I'm like, "All right." So they were probably six and eight at the time, I think. <laughs> so I, I figured, this. "All right." So we started getting tactically sound. Um, so you know we would stack up in the stack, you know, we'd have the stuffed animals would be the bad guy. You know, I'd have the, we'd have the debrief or the, the, the post raid or the pre raid in the living room, sit down. I'd say, okay, guys, Mr. Doodle bear, we got paper for Mr. Doodle bear. He might have a hostage. He was said he wasn't going to be taken alive. How are we going to do this? And so Zach, you know, they, they get their little plan together. All right, we're going to stack up. Zach's going to be number one. My daughter will be number two. You're number three, dad. I'm like, all right. So we get in line, you know, we stack up, you know, tap up. So they go, we go through, we clear the kitchen, then we go clear the bathroom, and then we come to the bedroom. Of course, Mr. Doodle Bear's in there. He's got Moose as a hostage. So <laughs> my son would like, he would always give his verbal commands, which were really good. He'd be like, Mr. Doodle Bear, I see you. Move to the center of the room with your hands up. Do not touch a firearm. So my daughter was always more tactically sound than my son. So she would be kind of giving him like, you know, poor commands or Zach, you're in the fatal funnel. You got to, you know, so they, they know how to quick wow. eat, cut the pie. <laughs> so they had all that shit by the time they were like eight or nine years old, which of course came back to haunt me with my ex-wife because she's like, you know, Hey, the kids don't need to be tactically sound when they're six <laughs> or eight years old. And I said, you know what? Actually our daughter is fantastic. Cause we'd have the debrief later about, okay, what do we do? Right. What do we do wrong? And she'd be like, dad, Zach's got an issue with the fatal funnel. I can't get him out of that doorway. He's either got a quick peek, button hook, and go in, or he's got to stand off and then blade around and cut the pie. And I I'm love like, this. you're absolutely right. You know, you've got your kids too indoctrinated when they go to a place and she says, hey, I'll have the front five, you get the back five, and right. this is how we'll do stuff. <laughs> well, my ex-wife used to call up and she'd say, why do the kids know about um, posers and people that get down, get down? And I said, what are you talking about? And she goes, well, Andrea – looked over at a group of people that looked to be a little bit shady. And she goes, I wonder if those guys get down, get down. I said, well, it's the difference between people that get down or people that get down, get down. Like you got your thugs or you got your killers. I said, so she's differentiating. She's trying to figure out, you know, who the thugs or the killers are. She's aware so, of her surroundings. Correct. Exactly. She's got, uh, she's, she read that book left a bang. I don't know if you guys have heard of that before, but it, it talks about situational awareness and what you need to do before bang, before the device goes off and it's mm -hmm. written for the military. And it's like, you know, things, anomalies, what you're looking for. So she read that book and she called me up. She goes, dad, I've lived my entire life left a bang. She goes, thanks <laughs> to this freaking nonsense <laughs> that you put us through back when we were kids. I go, it probably saved your life. Absolutely. But, uh, well, man, that kind of brought us 
felt forward a lot farther than what we intended. But this that's a great way. That's a great story to start off. But we got to reverse just a little bit. Sure. You've got your you've got your bio. What was it? Bio bio biochem degree. Yeah, yeah. It's in uh, biochem, and then um, junior year, I decided there is no way I want anything to do with biology, chemistry, or anything else. It was hard. I was barely getting by. So I took a um, uh, what was it? Adolescent um, adolescent psychology class or adolescent criminal psychology class, and I took it. And I found man, this is fascinating. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed what they were talking about. Um, we did a, uh, a tour of the uh, boys school in Indianapolis, Indiana. I went to school in Indiana. Um, so we went down to the boys school and I told the professor, I said, um, I want to do a report on the boys school down here. I go, but wouldn't it be cool if you put me into the boys school and I would just be in there as if I had gotten sentenced, you know, as a your juvenile. first UC role. Right. I thought this would be great. I go, because truly you're not going to really, I mean, I was listening to the guys pontificate and talk about their program and all that stuff. I go, but you really don't, but I'm watching these kids that are in there and I'm like, I think they've got a different story. And I was like, man, wouldn't it be cool if we actually got the story of what these guys, what it's really like being down there. And he actually bit off on it in the beginning. He thought it was a cool idea. And then he ran it up the, the flagpole and they said, no fucking way. We're not going to let you do that. But I looked young enough. I figured, you know what? We could work this. I go, I, so that kind of got my, that started the whole undercover thought process. And uh, I thought that would be, that would be a neat way to really get to the truth of the matter. I can't tell you how many episodes we've had now, Murph, where somebody says they were doing one thing until they took a criminal justice class yeah. and then everything changed. Oh, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> addictive. I mean, you, you, you know, Chris, I'm sure the same way. You, most police officers go into law enforcement to help other people. Sure. Absolutely. You know, nobody wants a mundane job. Well, I guess the cops don't want a mundane job where you're sitting behind a freaking desk all day inside an office and you can't even see the sunlight. Right, right. Oh, I met a couple of those folks. <laughs> hey, we all have our crosses to bear. There's no doubt. Yes, we do. We 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 call them rimps, rear ele- rear echelon motherfuckers. So right, <clears throat> but but there's a need for everybody. But so, but you you where did you go to college at? Uh, Manchester College. Um, Harvard Harvard's referred to as the uh, the Manchester of the East Coast. So yeah, yeah, it's it's actually yeah. Does that be like Manchester in England? Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, no, it's it's a small, really small uh, liberal arts college in the middle of Indiana. But um, but they also had an associate's degree that they gave there in criminal justice. So when I got out, I got the bachelor's. I finished that up because my dad would have shot me had I not finished that degree. And then um, I ended up uh, getting associates in criminal justice at the same time. So and that's I got out. I started working construction and taking police tests. You know, just trying to get on anywhere. So what year did you graduate? Uh, nineteen eighty three. All right. Good year. Good year. Yeah. So w- w- what's the first place you applied for? Oh, Cook County Sheriff's Department, every suburban police department, the Illinois State Police. Um, and at the same time, I was I worked security at the higher agency downtown on midnights. Then I did side jobs construction during the day. And so it's just a way to you know start getting my foot in the door a little bit. Um, let's talk about the Hyatt Regency for a minute, because there's got to be a lot of stuff going on. So what's the what's the best story about working security at the Hyatt Regency? Uh, the number of prostitutes that go through there uh, every night was always <laughs> you know, kind of kind of amazing. The amount of guys that got robbed by the prostitutes and then they were surprised that they got robbed later on was always kind of amusing. Um, you know, people go to hotels to do shit they don't want to do at home. So, uh, yeah, there was, you know auto erotic issues going on, you know, I found a couple of people hanging in the closet. That was uh, definitely interesting. So, yeah, so it was, uh, like I said, people go to hotels to do stuff they don't want to do at home. Well, so. sounds like you got a good, you got a good crash course in uh, CSI while you were there. You know? <laughs> uh, it was, you know, you, you never get that out of your mind. That first time you see that, I mean, you're just like, holy shit. You know, that was, you know, and, you know, and it was just, it was a whole strange lead up to that. He he was on a business trip with four of his friends. He didn't go down and meet them for breakfast. They were concerned, you know, and I'm like, well, what are you concerned about? Has he got health issues? No, we're just, so I think they kind of knew maybe what the score was a little bit. So by the time we got in there, you know, I went in looked to the left into the bathroom and I looked, closed the door and I looked to the right and there he was in a closet, you know, been there for quite some time. What happened? Did he, did, was he, you know, cause sometimes when you find these bodies, they, they give themselves a fail safe. It's like they'll lean forward, you know, so they can always lean back, but some of them sit on a chair or something. And if that thing slips out, 
you know, what what was was he like tied in a yeah a he was uh, bar he, in the closet um, or something? I think he just let it go a little longer than it needed to go. And I I don't from what I recall from the CPD guys, the Chicago police that came and investigated, I don't think he had a safety like a like a pull. Like if he fell completely forward with his weight, it would actually cut it. He was just on his knees, leaned forward, you know, his tongue out, aspirated out, you know. Post mortem lividity. Yeah, it was. it's that look, the swollen tongue, the eyes, ah. the purple color. Yeah, 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 yep. no doubt about it. You know, and he was addressed accordingly. Also, you know, so it was. Uh, yeah, it was a little different. You know, there I am, and that was the first. You know, other than uh, you know, we used to see floaters in the Chicago River go by people that had you know killed themselves or been murdered and dumped in the water sometimes bodies would float up and they'd come floating by so yeah it was um it was kind of a good first experience you know so <laughs> good <laughs> most people wouldn't consider that good i got to get on and cancel my reservation to chicago <laughs> <laughs> you know what brother it's uh it's a bit of a shit show over here right now i gotta tell you being perfectly honest man well yeah we'll get to that too at the end too because we, we want to talk a little bit more about that but um so you do this stuff what was the first agency that came through for you uh, ATF. Uh, actually, my uh, my ex brother in law was with DEA. I think he started in Miami and then went to Detroit, and then he came back to Chicago uh, and was hired by ATF. And he said, "He goes, put your application in. They're actually hiring right now." But it actually took me about three years, I think, to go through the process to finally get hired. Wow! That's yeah. what you do in the interim. Uh, work construction, uh, pounded nails, doing side jobs, and kept the security job just to kind of stay in the mix. So there wasn't a hiring freeze or anything? It just took that long? Yeah, there was a hiring freeze for about 14 months. I forget what the name was called at that time. But uh, yeah, so it was like 84, 85 hiring freeze. They were back on at 86. I got hired. Um, I came on June of 87. That's when I came on DEA was June 87. Dude, we are brothers in the struggle. We knew that. We knew we that. Knew that. Yeah, but it only took me two years to get on. When did you start? Oh, me. I, so I, my first, uh, my actually my first police job was a deputy town marshal in Victoria, Kansas, while I was going to college. Right so that. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't trust us. We didn't even have a gun. <laughs> they Dipsy were smart. They, You're probably like Festus on guns. Yeah, there's some Wyatt Earp shit going on there. No, Festus. Festus had a gun. <laughs> We actually had a community gun. We had a little uh, two-inch uh, Smith and Wesson thirty-eight sitting in the glove box that you had to go look for. You know, it's nice. like Jesus. <laughs> you know, it sounds well, like Barney on, on Andy and Andy and Yeah, no, I first started uh, March of nineteen eighty-two with the Salina Pol Police Department. Right. So, great Salina, Kansas, man, right there in the center of God's country. Which is Kansas, Steve? Yeah, where where <laughs> men are well, men are super scared. You did that was my line from last week. You can't appropriate that. That is that is cultural hey, appropriation of you humor. Need to respect yeah. your elders here. You need to shut the hell up and respect <laughs> me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to our regularly scheduled hey, listen, podcast. Listeners, we're kidding here. We're kidding. You know, we tell you, uh, we people, tell you come front, on. We're, we don't take ourselves serious. This is supposed to be fun. Look, if if you don't have enough, you know, uh, what we call epidural armor, if you don't have enough thick skin to handle this stuff, you are in the wrong line of work, yeah. my friend. Yeah. Right yeah. Because the fact. first time you the first time you screw up, which I might have had a couple of those, they never let you live it down. You go to training, there it is. You show up somewhere, there it is. Right. So oh, absolutely. absolutely. We'll talk about you now. So um, when you first got on, um, let, let's talk about that. So uh, 1987, you get on. Did you have a choice about where you were going to go for an assignment? No, I had put Chicago as my number one because I was from here. And it just happened they had a couple openings in Chicago, and I, I got to I got to start off in Chicago. So I worked in an organized crime group um, that uh, was kind of a task force, U.S. attorney, FBI, D, or FBI, IRS, actually, and ATF. Um, so I started out with there. I, I was very fortunate that I had, man, just a great supervisor and two great training agents. Um, my supervisor, my first day on the job, he goes, I don't know what you've heard about federal law enforcement, but the guys in my group, they work undercover. He goes, so I don't know if you've ever thought about doing it, but in my group, we work undercover. He goes, there's pickup trucks out there. There's cars, high end, low end. There's a motorcycle. He goes, there's money in the cash box over here. He goes, go out, start buying some guns. And I was like, all right, <laughs> this is great. So those are, you know, and it, my training agents were John Mazzola and Jimmy DeLordo, two old Italian guys that were just the quintessential great studiers of human nature. 
they just, they were great undercovers and they were great investigators because they just understand, they understood criminals and they understood criminal nature. Uh, I remember once it was uh, Jimmy Delorto, when I first started there, he had a case on a, uh, a wealthy man, Werner Hartman, that was a, uh, back in the day, remember we used to, car stereos were the big thing. You had this, you know, $4,000 stereo system in your car and stuff. Your car would be worth 300 bucks, but your stereo system right. was worth your life savings. Yeah. Well, this guy, this guy had made uh, millions of dollars in the car stereo business. And of course he falls in love with a stripper, you know, tale as old as time. She gets her. Boy- you, that happens. I know. That happens in Chicago. I know. Hard to believe. <laughs> oh. Hard to believe. She ends up. Wait a minute. Her- Did they go to the Hyatt Regency? Yeah. No. 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 This was uh, <laughs> this was all out in the suburbs. <laughs> so she ends up uh, hiring her boyfriend to kill Warner, her new husband, and she was also sleeping with the uh, insurance guy that changed the insurance policy from his daughters being the recipients of the five million dollars to her. And so as they're putting this case together. Um, Jimmy Delordo, he's just sitting at the table and he goes, you know what? He goes, he would always go like, to, you know, he'd tap his cheek as he was thinking. He goes, he goes, I bet that stupid bitch wrote a check. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, this lazy bitch wrote a check to pay off the insurance guy. So he calls up the U.S. attorney, gets a subpoena, sends me up to the business, uh, the bank that the company did business for. I get all their business records for the last year. I'm picking through it. And he goes, look for this guy's name signed by her. And I'm picking through it. Well, what do you know? $10,000 check to the insurance guy signed by her. And he looked at it and goes, I knew that stupid, lazy bitch wrote a check. But it's just, those were those kind of guys, man. They were just great investigators. And um, and they were great studies of human nature. John Mazzoli used to tell me, he goes, yeah, you're kind of a young cock. You think you want to run out and beat up everybody. You're a little, you know, you got that Irish shit in you and shit. It's going to be bad. He goes, don't be a, don't be a, you know, just kind of be a chooch. Don't be a chump alone, but be a little bit of a chooch. Don't be try to be the smartest guy or the toughest guy. He goes, just go in there, whip your game and leave. He goes, don't try to be something you're not. And I, you know, those were probably the best, you know, that's so the best define those I terms for us. Chooch and chooch well, alone. A, a chooch is like a, just an idiot. You know, or not an idiot, maybe a guy that's, you know, he's a little bit slower. A chum balloon is just a goof. He's, you know, he's handicapped. He's just stupid as stupid, you know, as stupid goes. Uh, <laughs> but a chooch is just a guy that's like, you know, he, he's he's not quite a chum balloon, you know. It's like is that a Chicago term? Yeah, or just, yeah. I think uh, chum balloon's a Italian Chicago term, yeah. Because my friends like Velosi and stuff say, now we had called him either a gavone or a spacone. You know, those were their terms for those types of people. But Mazzola said that he goes, man, don't try to be something you're not. And that, that was really kind of the best advice you could have got. Now, Lou talked about this, uh, when he was on ATF, did you, you know, one time ATF had some of the best undercover training there was out there. I mean, you guys really, did you, I mean, when you did your first UC role, what was your, what did your training consist of? John Mazzola said, this guy's got a sawed off shotgun. His name's Pig. (laughs) He goes, you think he can go buy it? I go, I think so. He goes, okay. So it was back in the day where he had Nagra recorders, which was like a reel to reel tape deck. So you shove that in your crotch, you know, you had a, and it heated up, it heated up. You had a one watt uh, RF (laughs) transmitter that was as big as a freaking, you know, pack of cigarettes. And that would get hot. And the, is that a Nagra or are you just glad to see me? Yeah, correct. Yeah. (laughs) It was very hard most of the time in the crotch area. Uh, not for good reasons though, but, um, yeah, so I, I went in and that was, that was my first, that was my first experience, man. But I, I had, you know, there were guys in the group. There was a guy, Mike Brostowicz, that was a, a former Marine that was a Vietnam vet. He'd been on about 15 years. He had a great look and kind of took me under his, his wing a little bit, kind of showed me the ropes. Um, he got jumped and beat up one night, you know, in an alley, he got robbed. He moved the deal around the corner and the guys got him. And we used to have those emergency, uh, pagers it was like a squelch break you know that was your trouble signal and so it just big squelch break over one of the frequencies which is like a sound um and that means well the first guy that punched him punched that that safety device and it broke so he was pushing it nobody was coming so i I beat him up pretty bad so the next day he's just smoking a cigarette he's got a big black eye and he went out the next day and he did another deal you know i just i looked at guys like that i was like man those are the guys i want to be like they were they were awesome did you were you able to ever to track down the guys that jumped him and did that to him yeah yeah we caught him 
<laughs> and, and how did they react when you said, hey, remember me? I think it was an unpleasant experience for the most part for oh, those guys. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was uh, it was good. I mean, you've got such a, I mean, there's obviously Chicago gives you a rich, diverse way, all the investigations you can work. In fact, I think um, one of Lou's cases was up in Chicago, wasn't it? Right. It was uh, my wife's uh, an agent also. Um, she's a special agent bomb tech, so I try not to piss her off. So if I get killed anytime soon by an explosion. You mean when you sit down on the toilet and it, that's it for yeah, you? I always start the car with the door open and a leg out, so I'm blown clear of the fucking wreckage. Like every other mob guy in Chicago. Um, yep. So, yeah, so she had a case on a, a mob bombing case, and um, and we brought Lou up to help do uh, some of the undercover. That's the gold teeth. I probably told That's you. That's the gold. Yeah, called. we did. We covered the gold teeth case. The FBI couldn't penetrate this guy, but Lou came up, he pretended to be a, a MMA fighter, yeah. and, or not pretended to. He, he was. Is. He was good. Yeah. And, yeah, he is. Yeah, worked out at the gym. and But I thought it was, I thought it was just brilliant, pawning gold fillings yeah well, teeth we knew, with gold this fillings. guy was smart i mean the guy was he was uh, the enforcer for the chicago outlaws he's also uh real tight and best friends with the heir apparent to take over organized crime in chicago uh, he was his driver uh he was super sketchy on anybody that came in you know we ran informants by him um we ran a bunch of you know, fbi ran some people into him they, they just he wouldn't bite on any of them. So I was like, we got to get this guy's attention somehow. So we sent Lou in with a crown Royal bag full of fucking gold <laughs> teeth from my dentist with a bunch of actual teeth in it with still blood on it. He says, I heard you buy gold here. And he pours it out on the counter. Now we were, the FBI had done one of those sneak and peeks where they had, you know, they'd gone in, you know, and, and wired the place up for audio and video. So Lou goes in and I'm telling, we're watching in the, in the room, the monitoring room with the FBI office downtown. I go, my guy's going to be in the inner sanctum on the first meet. And they're like, no fucking way. He's never going to get in. I'm like, bet you lunch. Sure enough, Lou goes in, dumps the teeth and he's like right into the inner sanctum, like almost immediately. And I was like, that's my guy. You know, it's like a, you know, your, your kid takes his first step or something. It was like, yeah. you know, father <laughs> I well, like, I think I think great. the difference culturally too is in the way you think. And look, we we all dog the FBI, and you know, and because it's it's state law. Actually, we're required to four times an episode, you know. <laughs> right. But but I think culturally though, it's the way that you think. I mean, it, it, the FBI does some great things. My sister in law is an FBI agent. Got a lot of good friends on the bureau, but they have a different way of thinking about things. But uh, the thing I think. I've always enjoyed working with ATF, especially like I said, we're doing some of the gun cases and felon, you know, you, you get a felon in a possession of a firearm, we could get him five years federal time, mm -hmm. no longer our problem, right? Sure. So we would have unique ways to do that. I always liked the way you guys thought about it because it's like, I can't imagine an FBI guy going, oh, well, we can't get the teeth. We need to get authorization. And you guys are like, hey, I'm going to borrow those teeth. You might get them back. You might not. I'll see you later. Yeah. But the thought of just coming in with the crown royal bag and just dumping teeth with blood on it and gold fillings, it's like, man, that's magic. And Lou, can, Lou can pull that off. I mean, his look and everything. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was a total package between Lou, the gold teeth, the crown royal bag. Everything fit. You know, it all made sense to the bad guy. You know, but I, actually, I got a <laughs> I have a really good working relationship with the FBI in Chicago. I did undercover for those guys on a couple of home invasion crews that they were they were doing. I did UC for them. And, you know, I. I really, uh, those guys were, were great. I wish we had their money and resources, you know, cause you come up with shit like the crown Royal bag and the gold teeth, because basically, you know, we're the, yeah, no budget. yeah we got, <laughs> we're the redheaded stepchildren of federal law enforcement, man. We got, you know, we got, we're lucky to have 2,400 agents across the country, you know, so whatever we do, we got to make it big. So you really gotta, you gotta get unique, you know, uh, on, on, on what you do, man, just by the nature of, we don't have the funding to do it, you know? So did you ever get a chance to attend the UC training? Uh, it's at uh, Fletzy. Yeah, yeah, I mean yeah. that that ATF put on your oh, classes. Yeah. I yeah. went to, uh, I think I went to the advanced undercover school in 1990, and um, then I started teaching the state. We did a state and local two week undercover school, and then we do uh, a two week undercover school for regular agents, you know, in the field. We're going to get into talking about one of the cases you mentioned, which was the Grim Reaper. Had you been to the UC training before this case started? Oh yeah, sure. Yep. Okay. How important? How important was that? I mean. I know that they don't do it anymore because that's that was one of Lou's complaints is that they quit teaching these UC courses and we'll get into that. Sure. But how important was it to have that kind of advanced training as you start getting into these bigger cases like Hell's Angels, like Outlaw Motorcycle Gangs? Because, you know, uh, these guys aren't the nicest guys. They don't tolerate uh, 
you know, informants. They don't tolerate uh, snitches. They don't tolerate UCs. Right. You know, I think the the thing that the um, the undercover schools actually promote and what they teach is like it's the way you look at a criminal group or an organization and, and how you're going to approach it. So like for we do, I mean, we generally look at a group or an organization. We try to find out uh, a weakness. We try to exploit that weakness. And then we try to insert ourselves into that spot. And then we whip our game. And once we get in, but you've got to, you really have to do your homework. And that's one of the things that we really stress at these schools is you just don't jump in and decide to join the Grim Reapers motorcycle gang or join this Grim Reapers white supremacist group. You have to, what's their ideology? What are they about? Who are their weak players in that group? Who's most likely to flip? What is their criminal backgrounds? What have they been into? Um, So those are the things that are taught at those undercover schools and they make the undercover agent, not only, you know, a great, you know, undercover agent, but they also make them a great investigator because those are those things you need to have, you know, to start any investigation um, is those basics. Well, not to mention you you need a backstory. You can't just go in and, you know, it was Chris Bayless or Steve Murphy and, and, you know, they start saying, where'd you you grow up? Who'd you run around with? Oh, I know that area. Especially if you're in Chicago, you grew up Chicago, which is great for you. Exactly. Exactly. And those are tough because like we said in Chicago, man, everybody knows everybody, especially in the criminal community. You know, it's like uh, I did the president of the Hells Angels in Chicago, Mel Chancey, but he had connections with organized crime. Every street gang leader, he knew of them and they knew of him and they would do work together. Um, so it's very, you know, it, the criminal community, you've got to have your shit together when you go in, especially if you're going after a group or an organization like the Grim Reapers. We, um, they get, you know, when we talked a little bit before about federal law enforcement and state law enforcement having kind of a symbiotic relationship, you know, we need each other. You know, you need those ground pounders, those guys that are out there every day. So, Chris, one of the other things, too, you mentioned the UC training was important, but then it was the importance of these relationships, federal, state, local. I mean, th- this is one where no one agency can do it all themselves because while you guys might have like the federal authority and a lot of the good laws, a lot of the local cops, a lot of the state cops, they got the local knowledge. They know how they know the lay of the land. And it's very important to kind of share that information. Let's talk about that as you're setting this up. You know, how was what was your approach to that? How did you how did you interact with all of your other partners at the you know federal, state and local level in Chicago? I always you know, when I first started, my uh, my group supervisor said, look, man, he goes local law enforcement, sometimes because they have a small PD, they might have their their Al Capone in that particular particular town might be a guy that's stealing cars. He goes, so we'll go out there and we'll buy some stolen cars off this guy just to help those guys out, even if it wasn't gun related. So you forge those, those working relationships. You know, these guys depend on you to come out and help them. And we're more than happy to go do it. Um, with the Grim Reaper case, uh, especially was, uh, an Illinois state trooper by the name of, uh, Jeff Patterson. He had worked probably five or six years, us working on the Grim Reapers, uh, going out and getting every traffic ticket they got, every home invasion they did, um, interviewing witnesses. Uh, they had done uh, a couple of rapes. They you know, were dealing drugs. They were beating people up in bars. They were shooting people to protect their territory. But no one would testify against them. So what he did was historically, he went back seven or eight years and had documented all this criminal activity that they were doing. And so when he brought it, he got together with his ATF partner, which is actually out of Springfield, Illinois, a um, guy named Don York. Don York, and they he came together. He goes, I think we could do a RICO here, but I'm not really sure. Don York on the federal side said, absolutely, we can. He goes, and we should try to get somebody in there because he, RICOs help if you have a storyteller and not just an informant storyteller. So it'd be cool if we got an undercover in there. So they ended up Again, when we go back to talking about looking at the group, the organization, finding a weak link, they found a weak link, a guy that had five or six felony convictions, a guy named Crazy. Um, They knew Crazy was always driving armed, so they knocked him down on a traffic stop, got a pistol off him, arrested him federally, took him into custody, and they got him to cooperate. The problem was they'd already arrested him. The club knew that he had been arrested, so right away they're like going to be standoffish on anybody, even if it's a brother. And he's just got locked up. So what we had to do was, as we were exploring our options, we thought we're going to do a, it wasn't a fake judicial proceeding, but it was a real judicial proceeding that we did with street theater. And so what we did was we got with Crazy's defense attorney and we said he wants to cooperate. You know, he proffered, he gave up all this information, um, but we need him back out there to introduce one of our undercover guys. So what they came up with was they had a court hearing where all the Grim Reapers were in there to see this court hearing. Um, 
And we had some street theater between the case agent, Don York, and the prosecutor. And they start getting in an actual, or not an actual argument, a fake argument about some of the evidence in the case. And the U.S. attorney looks at the case agent and he goes, I cannot do, I can't go forward with this crap, blah, blah, blah. And they get in this little fight. The judge is on the bench and everything. He's trying yeah. So the judge is like, uh, gentlemen, let's kind of calm it down. Do you have a, what do you got before the court today? And so the U.S. attorney gets up and he shakes his head. He goes, judge, he goes, I'm going to have to, uh, we're going to have to dismiss this uh, case with prejudice. He goes, right now. And he slams his book shut. And the judge said, looks at the defense and he goes, you know, any argument to the contrary? And they're like, no, sir. So, you know, the U.S. attorney slams his book down and gets his all stuff up and he storms out of the courtroom. And the judge ends it for the day. And, you know, crazy gets up and he's like the conquering hero and the gallery of all the Grim Reapers like, hey, fucking beat the feds, you know, and we wouldn't have believed it if we didn't see it for ourselves. So, you know, he comes out, you know, and he's the big hero. They take him out to dinner. They're having beers. And then in the course of about the next two months, he introduced me as his nephew. And so then I inserted myself as a hang around, then a prospect and then a patch for the Grim Reapers. But- well, let's. Hold on before you get too far down. Let's go back a little bit um, because I think one of the – this is something I've never – I've never – quite frankly, I think I've heard of a lot of things, but I've never heard of the street theater in a court where the judge is in on it, the defense is in on it, the prosecution is in on it. What were the grounds that they used to dismiss the case? What was the problem with the case? Was it a bad PC for the – stop? or actually, you don't have to have PC for a stop. You have to have reasonable suspicion, but – um, was it a bad stop or what, what did they come up Everything with? Everything was totally jet. The thing that they didn't what the thing that they alluded to and, and a, the prosecutor can dismiss with with prejudice or, or if it's with prejudice, then it's done forever. You can't go back and visit it. If it's without prejudice it means you could come explore it sometime later. So basically, there was no reason for him to dismiss it with prejudice. It was all fake. And he just said, Judge, right now, the information I have, I'm going to have to. I, I, I moved to dismiss these uh, indictment with prejudice and the judge said, i got no problem with it. Defense. And so we were off. Because it was a quote, fake, pro- it, technically it wasn't a fake proceeding because you're constituted there in court. How did you handle the dismissal of the charge? Because did they ever file any paperwork to legitimize it? Yeah, and then later we went back because it was dismissed with prejudice. We went back, filed against him, and then he was given certain considerations because of his, you know, introducing me undercover and providing testimony against those guys. So he got a reduction in his sentence at the end of the day. What about it made you think that he was, what made you think this guy was going to be the one to flip simply was he i mean you think that some of these guys that they've been in the uh gang that long you know that they're you know they're ready to do time it's like what what would he have done five years yeah no he would have he was looking at about 15 years so he was looking at a, at a stretch and this goes to that what we talked about before about that symbiotic relationship you know atf didn't know we knew of the grim reapers we'd investigated them singly before but we didn't have the totality of the circumstances like Jeff Patterson from the Illinois State Police did. And he knew this guy. He knew his family. He knew his kids. He knew everything about this guy. He goes, you know what? I just have a feeling this would be the guy that would that would do it. And and he was absolutely right. And so that started that that, you know, I was introduced then after that. And then the beauty of that whole thing was because uh, if you guys are familiar with Rico, um, the, it, well, we we might be, but let let we got a lot of our what we call our players listening. So sure. let's talk a little bit about Rico racketeering and influence corrupt organizations. Yeah, or the outlaws call it ridiculous indictments concerning outlaws. That's what they refer to it as. <laughs> That's cool. But, I like uh, it. Yeah, I did. I, I thought that was pretty smart too. But what Rico does is Rico allows us as prosecutors, as law enforcement, to kind of paint a broad picture. And it's kind of like a, you know, when, when you arrest somebody for a single individual crime, it's one thing. But when you've got a criminal group that has come together and they've done things to further the, the enterprise, which is the, the bike gang. So they protect their territory. They fight off rival gangs, uh, rival drug dealers. You know, these guys would take out or beat up or send them on down the road. So these guys, to protect their territory, to protect the enterprise, they did certain predicate acts. And so historically... You know, what we are able to do then in court, even acts that we can't prove the totality of, we can still show because it goes to the the furtherance of the enterprise. So we're able to tell a story about the criminal activity of these guys that really it's a mosaic of all these little incidents and violent criminal activities. We get to bring it all together and show it in a big picture. It's like watching a a motion picture uh, movie about something as opposed to like a, you know, a single episode sitcom. 
So um, let's talk about that process because we we got a good master class about how you get um, brought into a gang by Steve Cook. Mm-hmm. Sure, you know Cookie Monster. I we'll call him, <laughs> make him nice and gentle, Cookie Monster. Um, but you know we, we talked so so walk through the stages because it's also important to you just this is this is kind of the theory you were talking about a couple of your training agents. Um, I used to tell Steve, I, Steve hadn't heard it before, but it's like we used to call it the theory of the uh, young bull and the old bull, you know, yeah. sitting on top of the hill. Exactly. Young bull says, let's run down and have our way with one of those cows. And the old bull goes, let's walk down and have our way with every one of them. Correct. So the urge, the sense of urgency, sometimes you got to be careful because you just cannot get uh, get crazy out of uh, jail and stuff and then run right in trying to introduce somebody because that would have probably raised some red flags, sure. right? Sure. And with any undercover infiltrate, I mean, time builds credibility. So if a bad guy doesn't know you and you just showed up, hey, this is my cousin Tony from Topeka and he wants to buy an ounce of cocaine, it's like, well, it may or may not work. But if you're trying to infiltrate, it, you're in, it's a marathon. So you want to you wanna systematically go about it in a very uh, methodical way. And so, you know, you show up. You know, you play hard to get like your seventh grade girlfriend, you know, come here, come here, come here. No, no, no. Stay away. Come here, come here. You know, so you don't like, I don't know if I really want to join you guys. You know, it, it's that back and forth. It's just the normal ebb and flow of what that situation would be like. You don't want to act too over eager. You don't want to act too under eager. Uh, you want to act impressed by these guys, but you want to know that you're your own man. So there's a lot of nuances as I'm sure Cook went into it uh, on what they expect out of you. You get like a trading agent when you join a motorcycle gang, a guy that's your dad. Sometimes they call him your dad. Um, and he teaches you the ways of the ropes, you know, what's expected. If you see a rival gang member, this is what we want you to do. If you get in a fight, this is what we want you to do. This is how you act in public. Um, all that stuff. Don't embarrass the patch. Never lose the patch. You know, all this stuff, the nuances that the club wants. And they kind of teach you that. So I'd already been through two clubs, so I already kind of knew. I mean, pretty much you can shut your eyes, and it's the same rhetoric. It's the same what to do and what not to do, you know, throughout. It doesn't matter if it's the Hells Angels, the Outlaws, or the Grim Reapers. You know, it's pretty much all the same. It's and it's very Rico is very similar to what they call a continuing criminal enterprise. Also, yeah, CCE, which, right? Yeah. So you got to have a certain amount of predicate acts to meet the elements of the crime, and what it also does, in addition to going after the entire organization, but it, it also provides for enhanced criminal penalties. So these these folks can start out looking at twenty to life. Correct. Yeah, well, that's a good way to get their attention. But let's let's before we go too far down, let's set some more context about the Grim Reapers. So give us the demographics about the Grim Reapers. Like, who are they? What kind of group are they? Where do they originate out of? What kind of territory they cover? So let's understand. Introduce us to the, Grim, the Grim Reapers, Reapers Chris. Chris. They're kind of uh, they're a one uh, percent motorcycle gang, which is um, you know they're 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 aligned with and affiliated with the Outlaws. Um, they had, uh, they probably had nine chapters in five states. I think Iowa, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Um, probably about 500 members, I think, total at their during their heyday. Um, and they, I think, at the end of the case, we could show that they had um, sold, they had bought and sold from the Outlaws in Joliet 250 kilos of cocaine within a year. They had stolen a million dollars worth of Harley Davidson motorcycles. Um, we were able to clear up. A uh, ton of robberies, uh, home invasions um, at, at the end of the case, uh, based on the information we got from not only the historical stuff, but the proactive stuff with me being in there undercover. So it was a nice, the Grim Reapers were just like, a, you know, they had a white supremacist ideology type of thing, you know, no blacks. Hispanics, anything like that, into the clubs, you know, all white. They were affiliated with uh, some of the Klan guys in Indiana, so they they ran in those circles, and and had that kind of that kind of ideology. You know, they thought they were the coolest guys to ever walk the biker world. And what was the name of the operation you guys gave this? Uh, man, was, I was it Iron Horse? Yeah, it was Iron Horse. That's it. Yep, absolutely. Yep, that was it. I, I like that too, Iron Horse, because it's a motorcycle is like an Iron Horse. So you're sure, going after the right. You're going after right. the and I, you know, I was just looking up too, like their patch and everything. So um, the other thing they talk about too, they were started off as a three piece patch club. So what's the importance of having the different pieces to the patch? Well, it kind of aligns itself with the one percent type and type. So you've generally got a lower rocker that's either the state or the city from where the the club is. You got the centerpiece patch, which you know for the Hell's Angels it's a death head. For Outlaws it's Charlie. For the Grim Reapers it was this you know the death guy with the sickle. The Grim um, Reaper. And then and the top of it says you know Grim Reapers or Hell's Angels. So as you progress through 
your probation or your hang around, official hang around, then prospect period, then you get certain your your patch reflects, you know, where you're at status in the club. Start out as a prospect, you get a lower patch, and then as you move through, you get the center patch and the top rocker. And you said you became a patch member of the Grim Reapers? Yeah. Uh posthumously because we faked my death at the end of it. Cause I had to go do something else. So I was at the end of my, oh, no, 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 hold on, stop. Grade. You cannot give away the ending to the fucking movie before we get there. <laughs> this is fantastic, man. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, I did. I did. Way to, I did way to go, Mark. You ruined the book. We're done. We're done. All right. Oh, this join, us, go. join us next week for somebody who can follow the fucking script. All right. Now, <laughs> how, long, how long did it take you from, from your introduction to get patched? I think the whole, I think the case, it was a, a, just short of two years, I think, in its totality. Man, that's, a, that's a long UC. Yeah, but th- that brings up the issue that we talked about with Jay Dobbins with about as they were infiltrating is that a lot of times the Hells Angels were one of the toughest groups to get into because they would wait you out. Sure. They would make yeah. you wait. And one of the th- theories was, too, is that if you're if you're a Fed and trying to infiltrate, they want results. You know, you, yeah. you can't just wait two years to get a result. That they they got to have something, right? It's true. And the thing that helped us with the Grim Reaper case, we, we had the historical case in place already. So all I would have to do would be to talk to these guys about whatever incident happened before. Like, for instance, like one of the armed robberies, they did a home invasion where they went in, beat up these drug dealers, stole all their dope. So that drug robbery it actually happened like six years prior to me talking about it. So I went up to him one day and I said, man, I heard a story. You badass motherfuckers went in and jacked some fucking dudes up on a lick, beat the fuck out of them and tore out of there with like five bricks. That was, I go, damn, you know, that, that took some balls. And they're like, yeah, here's what happened. So then they go through and because we had the historical component and the witness testimony, now you got the guys that actually did it telling their story that they actually did it. So it helped me because I didn't have to go in and buy huge amounts of dope. I didn't have to go in and get some, you know, you know, extensive conversation to prove anything. I just needed little, little tidbits. And that, that was more conversational than it would have been if I was an undercover that had no knowledge of what these guys were totally into and just trying to infiltrate them and trying to get who's who in the zoo. I already knew all that. Now it's just up to me to select how that conversation went and to kind of guide it in the direction to get the best evidence. You used a term of art, a lick, and I don't think a lot of people know what a lick is. So It's a robbery. So you hit a lick, you know, jumping some, you know, birds would be kilos of cocaine. Ah, so you got your own language there. This is like a, a subculture. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. How many years was it after this? the crime was committed? Uh, it was six? six. It was six. But RICO allows us to go back to 1971. As long as you could show that within a five-year period of time, mm-hmm. they did an act in furtherance of the conspiracy or in furtherance of the yeah. um, what the what the group's doing. It yeah. extends the statute of limitations. Correct. On. And also, there's no jurisdictional issues either. You know, so you get a lot of out-of-state crimes. You can charge them. You know, we, we charge it all in the Central District of Illinois, but it was stuff in Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, Iowa, and Illinois. So let's talk about this getting inserted. So you, you he and crazy introduced you as his nephew. How long did it take before you had your first major, I should say, you know, uh, win or major break in the case, you know, how long did it take you to get to a point to where you were trusted enough that you got some compromising material? Uh, the first night I went there. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Come on, I was expecting they ran yeah. me through the ring or they checked no. me out the first night. It, well, it was kind of interesting because, and again, this goes to having that historical stuff and knowing who you guys are and doing your homework on them. So the first night I went there, um, I met the president of the Davenport, Iowa, uh, club and he was talking about this stolen Harley that that they had and the informant was he was very righteous and they they really respected that guy and they they took him at his word so I kind of wrote on his coattails at first but so I bought a stolen Harley the first the first night I met him put it on my pickup truck and drove it back and it was funny because the case agent uh Mongo Jeff Patterson from the state police he goes now don't be expecting anything you know you're not going to really get in there very good they're going to fucking run you through the ringer they're going to do a lot of this shit I go yeah, so it was kind of funny. So he would bust my balls throughout the rest of the case. He was always throwing roadblocks up for me and stuff. He goes, hey, they checked your background out. They had him run your social security. It comes back fucking nothing. And I'm like, no, my backstop's in place, man. He goes, no. He goes, they're going to question you tonight at the clubhouse. And he goes, what are you going to do? I go, well, I'm suck my shit up and go in there and figure out what's going on. And he started laughing. He goes, nah, I'm just kidding you, brother. He goes, 
that you're all good to go. And I'm like, you motherfucker, <laughs> man. So, it's hard enough doing this shit. You know, I'm fucking, my anxiety's through the roof. I don't need you throwing shit on top of it. But Yeah, but it's nice to have you on your toes before you go in there, just yeah. in case they do. Um, did you now, did you have to ride uh, a motorcycle? Oh, yeah, yeah. What'd you have? I had a FXR, 89 FXR. And was that was that government issued or did you yeah, buy that? Yeah, it was a it was a seizure. It was a seizure. They had uh, retagged it uh, and then put it back, stopped it, put it in my undercover name and stuff. Oh, did you like it? Oh, it was great. I love that bike. Well, describe it a little bit for the folks who don't know what that is. Uh, it's just it's a very comfortable. It's not super huge like a bagger, super big. It's not small like a sportster. It's kind of right in the middle. It rides really good. So for those long rides, um, you know, you had guys on old rigid frame Harleys riding 500 miles and then sleep in a ditch. You know, mine was a lot more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I remember I like some it. of those Harleys too, man. It's like you had the oil leaks, like you say, the rigid frames. It's like the weld yeah. sometimes might go out on those frames. You know, a lot back in the old days they would ride them, but there was a lot of quality control issues with some of the old bikes. Oh yeah, I was with a riding on another case next to a Hell's Henchman that his handlebars broke off as we were riding together. And I, he looked at me like help, and I looked at him like fuck, you know. And I was <laughs> I moved into the oncoming traffic to get away because I knew nothing was good was going to happen in about two seconds, man. So he's trying to shove the riser back on, and he just kind of went right down off into the ditch and crashed. Oh. Like, oh, man. But he had that look on his face like, fuck, you know that? Like, oh, shit. <laughs> Handlebars broke. How fast was he going? Uh, we were probably going 40, 45 probably. We were just bar hopping, you know, just riding together. And he was leaning forward. He had a rigid frame chopper with a stolen Evo motor. You know, it's just you know, that flex and you bounce on those choppers. So, and he had put some riser up for his handlebars and it just, whatever he had welded, he obviously was not a very good welder and uh, they snapped. <laughs> he pushed them forward. He's, he's trying to shove them back onto the triple, trying to get on the triple. I'm just like, oh, fuck, dude, you're, <laughs> see ya. And let me tell you, when we used to have the gangs come through Kansas, heading up to South Dakota, you know, they do the rallies and stuff. One of our favorite ways to stop them, we actually had a statute in Kansas. You could not ride a motorcycle if your hands or if your uh, hands were higher than your shoulders. Oh, so we pull those guys over and their hands. But the thing is, people don't realize you get your hands up so high. You don't have enough room. You don't have enough arm length to turn the forks, you know, on the bike. So Plus they go numb after a while. Too. Exactly. Exactly. You're not getting much circulation I I, up there. I just wish there was a video of this. <laughs> That's hilarious. That is hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's a trip. And riding in a pack, you know, you got guys going 90 miles an hour from point A to point B, about, you know, a foot off the guy in front of you. It's, it gets you got to ride crazy. tight, don't you? Yeah, you do. Yep. yep what were the do. helmet laws in Illinois at that time? Uh, there's no helmet laws. So okay. let those that ride decide, my brother. Do you remember the group Abate or the organization yeah. Abate? Yep. Yep. Those guys were big on the helmet laws. Oh, yeah. Brotherhood against totalitarian enactments. <laughs> right. Oh, now this, this is good, but I, I couldn't stop laughing. I can't, all I can imagine is some hardcore motorcycle guy going down the road, handlebars come off. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, just the look as he's, oh fuck, what do I do now? And he's going yeah. off into the ditch. Yeah. I don't, I'm not quite sure what the thought process was on that one, but uh, yeah, he, <laughs> yeah, he wasn't hurt too bad, but I mean, his bike was completely wrecked, you know? Oh my God! Well, anyway, that's that's a keeper, Ben. I just, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. Just the idea. You're hardcore, like I said, man. You're. It's like the look on his face had to be like. Whoa. Yeah, and he looked at me like, you know, hey, dude, do something. I'm like, fuck, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't want to beat this too much to death, but man, that is so hilarious. Now, no, how how one. much shit did he get for that later? <laughs> oh, they gave him total grief. Of course, they wouldn't give it to me because I was just hanging around. So, but from brother to brother, they they were in his shit. Like, like, hey, from now on, you don't weld anything anymore, ever. <laughs> <laughs> Keep right, the welder right, right. away it was from crazy. me. Yeah, it was fun stuff. But to answer your question, yeah, I I rode motorcycles all in college and stuff, and always had a bike. So, and plus, I had the best mullet probably in the late eighties, early nineties. I had Dobbins used to call it the best in show. And it was, did you have the Billy Ray Cyrus kind of mullet to describe your mullet? What kind of mullet was it? It was kind of a, it was a combo between the Kentucky waterfall and the, uh, and probably uh, the Patrick Swayze, kind of the Patrick Swayze roadhouse. 
did you have like curly? Was it curly or straight? No, blown back, babe. It was freaking. It looked sweet. It looked sweet. <laughs> was it natural? It was natural. Un natural. You didn't have like to put to process say. and all that crap in there. No, no, man. I was straight on, straight on mullet. It was the best. <laughs> I rode that. I rode the mullet probably longer than anybody should have ever rode the mullet, but I did. They used to say about mullet part, you know, business in the front, party in the rear, man. Party in the rear, yeah. <laughs> and you're, you know, if you know, most of those guys did at that time, you know, everybody had a mullet. That oh, was, yeah. uh, if you worked undercover, you got an earring and a mullet when you first started. I noticed that. You know, I was I was able to avoid like the that. earring. I got one of those uh, clip ons. You know, there you go. instead of getting the piercing, but had the mullet. Sure enough. What What about tats? Was it a rite of passage, even as an agent? If you're doing that work, you had to get some tats. I uh, I've got some shoulder ink done. I've got the Harley wings, and I got pride, courage, and loyalty for um, a friend of mine that was killed in Waco. Um, you know, so I've got a couple things. Got some stuff for my kids. I've got St. Michael, the patron saint of law enforcement. So I've got that stuff, but it's not. I'm not sleeved out or anything. Okay. Yeah. That's because a lot of times you see the folks, I mean, I know Lou's got some serious ink, you know, on, on his arms, but you know, not overdone, but I tell you some of those guys though, it's like you look at them and from a distance, it looks like they're wearing dark clothing until you get up there and it is just like ink from their wrist all the way up. Right, 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 right. Yeah. No, I never, never went that far. They didn't. So, so to become a member of the, of the Grim Reapers, they didn't have you have a tattoo on with their logo or one percent or anything. You could. It was after a period of time. They kind of modeled themselves out of the outlaws. So their prospect stuff was similar to how the outlaws ran their prospects. So um, you couldn't get any club ink unless you'd been a patch for a year. Couldn't get it as a prospect. Um, you know, you're constantly getting punched and, you know, you're always, you know, having to fight. You know, more or less, there was rules, no punching in the face, you know, that kind of shit. But, you know, they could punch you for no reason, you know, which happened a lot, which, you know, eventually you had to tell a couple of these guys because a couple of guys were actual wieners. Yeah, I mean, they weren't all that. You know, some of them were badass guys and some were wieners. And it always seemed like the wiener guys were the guys that would always punch you in the chest, you know. And I'd always remind them, you know, I'm not always going to be a prospect. You know, at some point in time, this might all end and we'll see what happens. So you put your $100 on the bar and then you guys get to go at it. Wow. So, hey, but here's an interesting thing, though, too, is were you was it expected as a rite of passage, you know, from one level to another? Were you asked to or uh, encouraged to be a part or commit crime? Because I know that's always an issue when you work UC. Sure. And we uh, we would always do street theater. So my excuse for not doing something they were going to do is like, look, um, I just don't do things stupid. Like, you want me to go shoot some motherfucker to prove I'm in a club? That sounds pretty stupid. And that sounds like a guy you wouldn't want in your club. So I would say I'm smart about what my do I do. I haven't had to go down yet, but I'm in the game. So I do think smart. You want me to do something? You go, Let me do it. And let me do it with as few witnesses as possible. But I'll handle whatever business you got I'll take care of. So I always carried myself kind of like that. And then we would do street theater. Like, I'd fake get into it with some other agents in a bar, you know, grab them by the throat, walk them out, you know, talk tough, that kind of shit. So we do that stuff. So they want to check your mud a little bit to make sure, you know, you got the moxie. Um, so we're able to do it through a lot of street theater uh, to kind of get these guys to believe one thing about you that, you know, obviously isn't true, you know, cause clearly I'm not, I'm not going to, I mean, not that we haven't gotten in bar fights and stuff like that, but that's not something you want to go do overtly you know, to try to prove yourself to these guys. So when I, you know, for real. So if I do it fake with another agent, then it, you know, it covered enough that they thought I would get down if I had to. And nobody gets hurt. Right. You've heard of the infamous Lou Velozzi story with Jaybird in the strip bar before they ran an operation? Yeah, I was there. Yeah. Oh, you were there? So, oh, yeah. let's, so uh, let's hear this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was the unholy alliance was when I brought Lou in. So, uh, yeah, actually it was – um we had, we were doing some, Jay arranged, he had some guys that were building these remote control car bombs. He bought probably 25 pipe bombs off these guys. And they were trying to work their way into selling these car bombs, remote control devices to some of the cartels to be used in Mexico. So Lou comes in with me, Jay brings us in and he has the bad guys that are in this little group of home invaders uh, and, and bomb makers, he has them pick us up at the airport. So they, so we go to go to the airport. We fly blue and I fly in together. So the bad guys pick us up at the airport and they're like laughing. They're like, fuck man. And not 
because I look like a badass because Lou looks like, you know, Satan incarnate. Mm-hmm. So they get on the phone with you like, man, we knew your crew would be badass. These motherfuckers, man, they're old school. Fuck, this is awesome. So we wine and dine a little bit. We talk about this remote control car bomb and other guys making that I'm going to get tomorrow. And we weren't asking them to build these. They had already built them. And so we, you know, of course, we don't want to get into anything where they're building a bomb and it fucking goes off. So this is stuff these guys already had and already had concocted. And they had told Jay, we got one more with this remote control. And so he's like, okay, great. So he brings Lou and I in. We get picked up the street theater at the airport. Uh, we go out to dinner with these guys. We have a couple of beers. We end up at the strip club. So Lou's wearing the... Uh, the uh, the recorder, the Nagra, and a couple other devices in his crotch. So we're at the strip club. So Jay, to fuck him up a little bit, sends a stripper over to give him a lap dance. And she's rubbing on him and shit. And he's looking at Jay like, "What are you doing?" You know. And these guys had never worked together. They didn't really know each other. I was a friend of both, and I kind of brought them together. So we're sitting there, and this chick's rubbing all over him. So he goes, you know, he brings says, you know, kind of figures to her. He goes, "Hey, come here, come here." So she leans down. And he goes. My buddy over there, the bald dude, cue ball, he loves fucking when chicks fucking punch him. So do me a favor, 50 bucks, just give him a little fucking love tap on the cheek, will you? She's like, cool. <laughs> so she goes back over to Jay. She gets on Jay's lap, and she's lap dancing for the next song. Now, she has some freaking rings on her fingers and shit. <laughs> she rears back and gives him a straight from the shoulder blast right in the fucking cheek. And Jay's got those high cheekbones, you know. She cut him like a three inch fucking gash on his eye, blood spurting out. So he looks over at Lou, of course, you know. So I go, oh, fuck. So we go go. in the bathroom. So we we were fortunate that the SRT guys were going to knock it down the next day when we got the bomb and and some other things. So we had two SRT guys were in there. One of them was a medic. So he had his little kit with him. So he's in the bathroom fucking butterfly and jay up and getting that crazy glue shit or whatever to <laughs> stick it together to stop the fucking bleeding you know so it was just fucking funny he comes back out so so lou tells me as jay's walk away he goes ah, pretty much this is going to be my last undercover deal with jay huh and i go maybe maybe we'll have to see <laughs> so, yeah, that was oh pretty my funny. god the story is complete now we got lou's side we got jay's side and now we got your side we got the real it side. just doesn't get any better than this <laughs> Yeah, and hey, we so, did get the bomb the next day, so it was all good. When when she punched him, did he stand up immediately and dump her out on the floor? Like what the what the hell, there, bitch? No, he just no. It was funny because in typical Jay fashion, which I've seen a million times, he just like glances over. She's still on his lap. She goes, "Did you like it?" He goes, "Sort of." And then he's like, <laughs> he looks over at Lou, you know, and and then she started realizing maybe this dude isn't doesn't get to like it. But I'm telling you, this chick, she looked. Like from an MMA punching standpoint, yeah, she was on fucking point. Man. She came and she rotated her shoulder into it and just freaking. So the next day, yeah. I had this big fucking mouse during the during the takedown. So oh, was funny. holy cow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. The next, it was funny because we were flying out that next day after the arrest, and uh, I was going to my first daddy daughter dance. So I'm telling Lou, you know, about man, I'm super stoked. You know, my daughter, she's got this dress, and you know, we're doing all this stuff. He goes. He goes, dude, he goes, I'm worried I'm never going to work undercover again because of this shit with Jay. He goes, your biggest concern. I go, is the daddy-daughter dance, of course. <laughs> I go, you're going to be fine. I go, don't even fucking worry about it. You know, and that's, He's like, all right, all right, all right. That story right there is just, that's, that's, that's perfect. Because here you yeah. are, you're going up against these stone-cold killers, one percent or motorcycle gang members who are out building bombs, going to blow people's shit up, murder, drugs, rape, torture, everything involved. And you're getting on a plane to go to your father daughter dance. That's, I love yeah. that shit. I love it. Yeah, I was, you know, dude, it was that was awesome, man. Because I'd missed so much, you know, with those guys being away and stuff. And you know, if we talk about that a little later on, but yeah, it's just that, you know, it wasn't it wasn't real. I wasn't I wasn't doing a good job of balancing that. That's that's for sure. I do any of us? I don't think any of us do. Yeah, and that's something we'll definitely want to talk about at the end because we've all been. I think we're all in the second marriage uh, club, or you know, yeah. sure. Our kids are the yeah. ones that suffer. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and apparently, uh, Jay, all I can think of is between yeah. Jay and the motorcycle <laughs> handlebars coming up. Was the look the same between the guy on the motorcycle and Jay? 
nah, sort of. There was a, you know, a lot of emotions in a very short period of time oh, as yeah. the brain's trying to comprehend the totality of the circumstances. Yeah. I would have just yeah, liked, so I would like to see Lou's face when he gets the look from Jay like, oh, yeah. shit. I yeah, yeah you can tell because Lou's got that when something's wrong, but he's smiling, but he knows something's wrong. He gets that furrowed brow kind of look. Yeah. It's that nervous smile. smile. It's yeah, like, it's okay, that. you're going to kill me. I know. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, that'll be fine. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so, right. so, yeah, so it was... What a, yeah. what a good divergence. So that was important. I don't know why it was important to tell, but now that we can bring the triumvirate together, I guess our next episode will be finding the fourth guy that was there and getting his side of the story. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get the girl. Get the SRT medic. You'll get the stripper. <laughs> yeah, we'll get the stripper on here. I don't know what – yeah, that – I think it would be easier to find the SRT medic. Yeah, she's right. probably, she's probably no. dead. Well, let's let's get back into that. So, I mean, uh, talking about the, the, the Grim Reapers and stuff. So let's let's get back into your investigation. So guys' sure. handlebars come off, you know, all that good stuff. You, you've got the fights going. But you talk about you, – obviously your first big break that first night, you get the motorcycle. Where does it go from there? How, now that you've bought that, it kind of legitimizes you with them, right? They're kind of like, hey, he's buying stuff. And hey, how much did you have to buy it for? Uh, I think I got it for 600 bucks. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, it was next enough. Yeah, because you get you know friends and family right at that moment. So I think I, I think I got that one for six hundred. Um, so what we did when we got back, we kind of retooled. Like, okay, obviously they'll sell to me. So we made a list of guys, their acts, things they did historically, drug amounts, uh, dope that they've been arrested for, and so we just we developed conversations for each one of those guys that would help us then show the historical component of the case, and so. When we'd go to runs or we'd be out, you know, I I usually try every night that I was there, I'd try to hit at least, you know, I think there was 14 or 13 in my chapter uh, at that time. I'd try to hit two guys a night for that type of conversation. You know, I wouldn't push it, but if the conversation went that way, I'd certainly allow it to go a certain way and then ask questions about it. Were you wired up? Oh, yeah. 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 Did yeah. you ever get searched? Uh, For those guys trying to think they went through my truck um they went through when i took my jacket off uh they went through my wallet at one point um they ran some girls at me so they did tests but no one ever no one ever actually put hands on and searched me they had an rf meter uh in inside the uh in the clubhouse but i didn't i always had a recorder i didn't have a transmitter i had a transmitter in the truck if there was an emergency my plan was to get out to the truck fire it up and then I had a repeater in the truck also set up, so it, it would send out, I could get out pretty far, at least five, six, seven miles. So it definitely the cover team would hear it. Explain to our, our listeners what an RF meter does. So a radio frequency meter. So all it is is um, it any radio frequency. So any two-way communication, like when you key up your microphone or if you have a CB radio or something of that nature, whenever you key it up, it sends out. Uh, frequency RF radio frequency and so there's a meter that actually reads that radio frequency and and so they had scanners in there also um so um if you were to walk in the Grim Reaper clubhouse and you were wearing a wire that was sending a signal out transmitting out then this meter would ping above the door and it would let you know this guy's wearing a wire yeah so so that that was the RF meter and they're, they're, they come in wands. There's uh, a bunch of different ways that they're they're used. The uh, the last undercover I, I did with DEA, I was buying hundreds of pounds of weed off some, actually some boys from West Virginia that were living in North Carolina, but they were getting it from the Mexicans up in Chicago, as a matter of fact. And uh, and I'd been wearing a wire through all the meetings, but the meetings have been in parking lots. We were in uh, Mount Airy, North Carolina, Mayberry, RFD. Man. Mayberry, RFD, right. Barney was there. Yeah. So when we went to take them down, uh, we took them to the, you know, the nicest restaurant in town, McDonald's, for breakfast on a Saturday morning. Correct. The freaking right. place is packed. I mean, that's where everybody in Mayberry or Mount Airy would go for <laughs> breakfast was McDonald's. Right. And so right. what we did, we had a bunch of UCs in there, the, the rest team, and, and I'm buying the guy breakfast. And we wait till he get the, the tray in his hand. You know, he's carrying his food. And that's when two state bureau agents step up and they go on each side. And, you know, they quietly spoke to him, but they convinced him that he doesn't want a buck, that, it, you know, he'd probably go to the hospital. Well, when we got him outside, cuffed him up, he had an RF meter in his pocket. No shit. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. You know, what we did to overcome that a couple of times is we'll get like a, a hundred watt linear amplifier and just key it. And let it go for a while. And so around the clubhouse, it would just ping that 
freaking meter. You know, oh, it would cool. pick up and it would just ping it. And so and we do it when I wasn't there. So they would do it to the point where it fluctuated so much. They were like, I don't know if that thing really works enough or not. So we, yeah. we did that at a couple of different places. Hey, when you went in, every time you went in there, let's talk about your cover team too, uh, because you couldn't be so close that they would get identified, but you couldn't be so far away that they wouldn't be of any help to you. So how did every time, and I think people think that you're just like John Waning. It's like, you, I'm going to go see the club tonight. So it's like, you just put your coat on, you walk in. It's like everything, like you say, there's a plan for everything right there. Every time you go out, there's a plan. Sure. Absolutely. You know, we, we've times like if you're going, if you're going to stay later, make an excuse after 11 o'clock to come out, you know, just real quick, hit the wire, hit us on the cell with a code and let us know, um, you know, you're, you're staying, everything's cool. Everything's 10, four and, and you're good to go. So yeah, we plan for everything. It, it became more the Grim Reaper stuff for the long term. I mean, I had a crew that just traveled around. If I go different places, different States, this group would go with me. Um, so the all great guys. And then with the Gideon operations, we're talking about later. Um, yeah, we have, that is planned you know, to the T because we ended up in a, in quite a few shootings in those and eight undercovers getting robbed. And so it was paramount that you have a plan before you go and do anything so that when it goes to shit, you know, you're executing that plan. You're not formulating one. You know, and, and for our listeners here, you, you know, you see in modern day about the Hells Angels and, and how they collect toys for tots and crap like that. Make no mistake about it. These are freaking criminal organizations. This That's what Absolutely. they're in business for. They're not, whatever their yep. original ideology is, they're just nothing but stone cold criminals now. And it doesn't matter. There's no one crime that they focus on. It's it's open season. They're poly criminal organizations. Absolutely. You know, it's like crime in general. It's opportunistic by nature, you know, and those guys avail themselves of any opportunity. Plus they have the cloak of being a hell's angel. Who's going to fuck with them? Very few people are going to testify against them. If they rip somebody off on a drug deal, ah, so what? Don't deal with us again. You yeah. Know who are you going to call? 911? Yeah. Hey, yeah. I just got ripped off on a drug deal. Yeah. We yeah. don't care. We did have that guy the other day that called him because he thought he got ripped off on his meth and he wanted the cops to come and test it for him. Because he was an expert on meth. He knew he is a, was an experienced <laughs> meth user. And this, after, you recognize after him, Chris. Adjusting, He's got yeah, big right. L on his forehead. Correct. <laughs> Oh, that's freaking hilarious. God love people like that because they make for great stories. But um, yeah, that's true. So let's kind of book in this too. So we kind of know where we're at in the story how, from the beginning until the end. How long was your operation against the Grim Reapers? A little under two years for the undercover part, but the historical stuff had been going Went on. Back six, yeah. yeah, about eight years. Yeah. Totally. So what's the closest you ever came to being um, uh, burned on that? Did you, did, was there ever a time to where uh, it was close or somebody was going to out you? Uh, on the Grim Reaper one, the only time was, it was my own fuck up. Um, I had become pretty complacent in my story. Um, and I usually tell the same story for every club, every group, what I do, how I do what I do. It's basically, so it just comes naturally. Um, but in this case, I had changed a couple of things and I forget what they were in the beginning of the story. And one of the brothers had just got out of jail. So he was in jail when I first started. So when he showed up on the set at the clubhouse for the first time after he got out of jail, he started asking me all the questions that I had already been through uh, a year and a half before. And I started to like, fuck, what did I tell you? <laughs> you know, you start to second guess. Did I tell these guys the the business was in Joliet or Chicago, you know, so I was kind of abadabbing a little bit and that dude's spidey senses freaking like almost immediately. He fucking, you know, he leans back in his chair and he crosses his arms. He goes, Oh, really prospect. Oh, really, Prospect? Hmm. Hey, hey, you motherfuckers. Did you fucking, is he really, did anybody check this shit? Does anybody know where his fucking family's buried? Because he's like, well, where's your family? You know, where are they at? We had it all set up in a place in uh, Morton, Illinois, that there was, I just, there was, we had a uh, fake marker. Uh, we got together with those guys and it was, Decker was my undercover name and it was my parents and they had died. So if they needed to see that, you know, they could go out and see that. And then sometimes they would ask you to do shit like oh, that. You even went to that extent to put up fake grave markers? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Wow. Yep. And then you got the paperwork in the background to to do all that. You know, we had like a newspaper article I had about, you know, their death. I had, you know, just stuff you have. You know, we call it just, you know, wallet clutter. You know, I put it in my undercover truck because they would go through it and they'd see shit, you know, stuff to make sure that it it matches to what your story is. So what happened with this dude? How did you get, how did you extricate yourself? Steve, that's a big word. That means how did you get out of it? Well, thank you. Thank you, dad. 
I started pretty much kissing his ass. I think after <laughs> that, man, you're the best Grim Reaper ever. I want to, whatever you are, you, you set the standard for all Grim Reaper. You know, I really, I just, I just started freaking, you know, uh, you know, just talking to the guy and kind of basically after a while, talked my way through it, you know, but fortunately he started smoking weed right away and that ended, you know, and he started getting back into the dope. <laughs> Killed and, a few brain cells and yeah, that was the end of that memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it ended, but you know, those guys, they don't, they might not have gone to college, but they got that PhD in, in criminal, Street. criminal activity, man. They know what's They're in smart. Oh, yeah. They're very smart. Street they smart. can smell that shit, smell that shit out, man. Especially coming right out of prison like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. The guy was, he was hardcore. So how did you make the decision to bring uh, Operation Iron Horse to an end? At what point did you say, enough, we have enough? Um, I tell you what, I was, uh, I talked to Spuds or Don York, we call him Spuds, the ATF case agent. He's like, man, get, you know, get the full patch and, and do all that stuff. I go, really, we have everything, you know, we kind of need. It would just be for, you know, kind of almost gimmicky just to get the full patch. I go, but if you guys want me to stay, I'll do it. I said, but there was also other cases that I wanted to do that, were starting to kick off. One of them was back, uh, the historical case we were doing on the Hills Angels. I wanted to be part and parcel to that. And so because of that, um, uh, it's just like, you know, it, it just seemed like a good time to close it out. So, uh, we, we fake, they wanted to keep going with the informant a little while longer and do a couple other things. And, um, so we kind of, we faked my death. We, uh, had a police report done, had a fake investigation through the Joliet police department, crash pictures. We had a funeral home that, that helped us out with mass cards and, and said I was already buried and, you know. Well, let's let's talk about that for a little bit. So, um, because we we talked, Jay Dobbins helped fake a death because we actually had um, we had Sherry Oz, uh, who was um, Phoenix PD, ended up working with Jay for a little bit on part of the Hell's Angels case, uh, and they they used that street theater later to fake a death for DEA as they were working a case. How did you go? What was what was the reason for faking your death as opposed to just saying, "Hey, I'm moving" or something happened? You know, I'm, yeah. I'm out of here. Well, there's a whole process then that would have come about if that happens. They would have wanted the bike. They would have wanted my Harley if I quit the club. Um, the informant would have been freaking his name would have been mud at that point. They probably wouldn't have dealt with him very much anymore because I quit the club. Um, we had done uh, previous before we decided to end the case about probably six months before we'd done probably 25 indicia warrants where we kicked the doors on all the clubhouses and all the major players. What kind of warrants are those again? Indicia. So you're looking for, it's for us, for the RICO, it's, you're looking for records. You're looking for any type of paperwork that would show these guys being involved in this club activity together. Um, and so when we hit them, actually, it's kind of a weird, funny story. This is, goes back to when you talked a little bit about when did you think you got burned? Um, when we did those warrants, we were actually going to end the case right after we did the Indicia warrants. Uh, because they said, hey, man, you know, you're in pretty much the majority of the probable cause to get into these places. I'm like, well, if we seal it, um, we don't let them know. We don't arrest anybody. We just take the evidence. We could still go forward. So went back and forth with ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, but I said, look, I only got about a week because these guys got all hit, 20 warrants. Everybody's kind of scattered. The word was out. Hey, don't come around the clubhouse. Your house is going to get hit, um, blah, blah, blah. So once the kind of everything settled, nobody went to jail. Um, you know, they started looking around, okay, how did we get done? Who did us? That kind of thing. So if I stayed out any longer than a week or so, it would have looked like I might've had something to do with it. So it actually, unfortunately went on about three weeks and they said, do you think he can get back in? I'm like, yeah, two weeks ago, it probably would have been all right. But three weeks now they're, I'm sure they're wondering how did they get done? Uh, so I gave it a shot anyway, and I went back and there was some uncomfortableness in the beginning. I ended up in a clubhouse in Kentucky in Louisville and uh, I was tending bar and, uh, they were having a little bit of a powwow about everybody getting raided. And one of the guys said, uh, you know why we didn't go to jail, don't you? And they're, everybody's looking, they're like, cause we're getting infiltrated. Somebody infiltrated us, you know, and I'm sitting behind the bar going, it's not me. I'm not, the, I'm not the guy. You we'll know, talk about it was a another fight. guy. It was another guy. That's and where it's good to around. act like, what'd you call it? A cheech or, you know, act like a, cheech. like not, yeah. You don't want to be the brightest bulb in the room when something like that happens. Right. By Correct. design. Correct. And so I was sitting there, I'm like, oh, fuck. And so that was, an, I was just like, so they go, well, who, who fucking did it? And they're like, well, 
you know, fortunately, there were a couple of warrants that they got probable cause on based on other information that wasn't me. So when one guy actually asked me a little bit about it, man, you weren't around and now you're back around. What the fuck's going on? I said, bro, man, I know nothing about fucking, I didn't know about Cherry Hill's bike shop. I go, I was never there. I didn't know who Cherry Hill is. So how the fuck would, how would I give it any? And they were like starting to think about it. So there was enough plausible deniability. So we were able to continue on for the next six months. And then we got even better conversations after the fact, because they're talking about, Hey, we got to watch out for remember, remember when we did this. Okay. We got to make sure no witnesses on that. Uh, remember when we did that robbery, we got to get to that fucking person we robbed, make sure they don't testify against it. Instead of keeping their mouth shut, they're going, Hey, remember all these bad things we did. We got to be careful about it now. Yeah. So Chris, we got even more evidence on tape. I got to ask you, man, did you ever think maybe it would help you out to go get some psychological counseling that you kept going back into there? Well, you know, it was one of those things where, again, as you know, you weigh like, okay, now what would a bad guy think? You know, what's different? One of these, what doesn't belong right now? We just got hit with a bunch of search warrants. How did that happen? What's different than what we've been doing all last 20 years you know is it the new guy but i'd been around long enough that i had credibility but again you know you're the new guy so when they you know and they're very you know those guys again you know they they can sniff that shit out so yeah i was in louisville i came out and i was like motherfucker man so then i started i got back and i called the asac that told me you know oh don't go back and then said no no go ahead and go back i go look motherfucker yeah I go this is what happened you put me in a bad position based on your own fucking stupidity yeah Yep. Go on. Uh, mm. Go ahead. Well, let's talk about faking your death. So bring us, bring us around uh, the discussion that went around that. How did that finally come about? How did that happen? I mean, uh, there, as Mark Twain said one time, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> so you're still right. with us. So how did your, how did your exaggerated death happen? Um, I disappeared allegedly for a couple of days, uh, three days to be exact. Um, they were like calling up crazy. They were calling up me. Where's Chris? You know, he's supposed to be here. He missed the meeting, blah, blah, blah. And the whole time I was splitting my time between, I had an undercover apartment in Joliet, Illinois, and they were about 200 miles away. So it was nice that I wasn't going to get any pop-ins from these guys. So um, I had my girlfriend at the time call the president and she said, Hey, I got some bad news. Uh, You know, Chris got killed in a fucking truck accident you know, burn beyond recognition, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about you guys. He wouldn't share any of that shit with me, but I, you know, I did know that, you know, he really liked you guys and really wanted to be was, you know, I told him I was planning on moving my construction business from Joliet out there. You know, I kept putting them off, putting them off. Um, she says, so, and they were like, immediately they smelled a rat, you know, so they sent a guy out, I got the, she goes, I can send you the newspaper and the obituary. And they're like, hey, we want to talk to you. And she's like, you know what, fellas? You guys scare the shit out of me. <laughs> I don't really want to talk to you guys. <laughs> so he goes, I'm just giving you a courtesy. I'll send you the, you know, the obituary card, you know, everything. They're like, uh, okay, all right, send that shit to us. So she mails it all out. So they send a couple guys out and they are aligned with the outlaws in Joliet. So they had the Joliet guys go to the PD, look up the record, make sure there was a police report. You know, it had everything there. We had already, you know, put that in place to turn over if anybody came looking for it. So they went to the funeral home and they're like, yeah, we remember that. It was a cremation. You know, we we had no, it was a uh, family only grave site. There wasn't a, uh, wasn't a wake or anything. It was only his girlfriend and his brother. And they were like, oh, okay, all right. So those guys were great. They helped us out a lot. And then, um, and that was it. So the informant stayed in place and he kept going about another six months. And I went back and started working on the Hells Angel Rico. So, but you can fake a police report and stuff like that, but, but how do you, you know, was there, I guess that's a time too, where there's no social media, thank God. Cause some of that stuff, you would think that stuff would end up on Facebook or Twitter. Right. So, correct. but, yep. but how did you actually did, was there an accident that you took advantage of, or did, was the accident just completely fake accident? We took advantage of. Yeah that just happened at the time. And we changed the newspaper article um, with the one we sent them was different. If they'd really looked into it, they probably could have sniffed it out a little bit better. But once they got the, they came out and they got the police report from the outlaws, they were like, ah, fuck it. You know, he's dead. You know, we're not really, they, they did want my bike though. They kept calling her up saying, Hey, you know, he was part of the club. Part of the agreement is we get his bike. If anything happens. And she's like, I'll have, I'll have his brother call you. So I had Steve Martin, who was the, DAD at the time of ATF, um, one of the muckety mucks. I had him call as my undercover brother. And uh, he said, no, nah, you guys ain't getting the bike. Stop looking for it. You know, that's the only thing he had left. We're giving it to his kids. 
And they're like, oh, okay, okay, that's cool. Wow. I'm surprised they gave in that easy. Yeah. Yeah. No blowback from that? I mean, nothing was compromised until the operation was over? No. Nah, no. Nah. And they even, uh, they had a meeting. They, that's when they gave me my full patch was they had a meeting the after they cleared everything and they made sure it was for real. They, uh, they gave me my full patch and they, they burned it out in the backyard. And, uh, that, that was for me. <laughs> wow. So I got my full patch. <laughs> Jay got his full patch too. Yeah. They said nice things about me. Oh yeah. This is shit. So yeah. Yeah. Nice things. Of, what was your undercover name? Uh, Chris Decker. We've talked to some other folks about this, but it's been a few episodes back. Tell everybody the importance of why you might have a different last name, but why you want to use a very similar or the same first name. Because uh, <laughs> you never know who's going to come accidentally see you during an undercover deal in a bar or something, and they come up to you, and your undercover name's Mike, and they're like, hey, Chris, what's going on? Yeah. And you're like, no, Mike. No, 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 no. You're Chris. I've known you since high school. Chris Bayless. Like, no, Mike. So, yeah, so that's, and you don't want to get tripped up, and that's a very easy way to get tripped up. Yeah, just keep it simple. That's the same thing with Dominic. You know, Dominic talked about he used the same thing, you know, just you, you use the same name, uh, use the same first name, Dom, you know, so it's, but you're right, because you don't want to get tripped up. Or the other answer is, well, because I'm Irish, it's Christopher Michael. I go by either, you know? Right, sure. Yeah, or well, Michael Christopher. Around. Too, when somebody, when somebody yells your name, Morgan, you automatically turn around. But if you're using Correct. a fake name, you don't have that that immediate response. It gives you Assuming right. that right. is my real first name. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, we this protection right. program. We can tell him what we call him, but I don't want to hurt his feelings. <laughs> that's prote- hey, that's privileged information. It's, it's classified. But uh, uh, That's awesome. All right. So let's talk about bringing this because I want to get into the uh, uh, Operation Gideon, the Gideon operations. But So what was the outcome of this case eventually? What, what happened? How did you take them down? And when you did... Did you get to do one of those things, show up in court and go, it was me? <laughs> yeah. Well, they actually, I thought it was interesting because even after they got in, they were indicted and they were all arrested and stuff. And they're looking at the indictment and um, they still were having a hard time putting two to like, who's this guy undercover one? Like, well, what's how, you know, and they're like, fuck. And then they, they kind of put it together. Like, oh shit. It's the dead guy. So then they realized um, uh, this is going to be a problem. So they, they broke it down. So we had, I think, uh, probably 65 defendants total. We took 19 on the Rico and the, and the other 65 were just standalone drug buys, drug deals, you know, gun or stolen Harley deals. Um, so we took 19 for the Rico. Everybody pled. Um, we were getting ready to go to trial. You know, I spent, God, you know, five or six months transcribing tapes and, you know, making sure the attributes were correct and what was said was right, you know, and validating all the, the transcripts. And it, I mean, it's voluminous. It takes a long time to do that. Um, so once we got done with that, um, the last guy to go was the guy that was the president. He was the national president, Ed Days. Um, finally, I think his attorney talked to him and said, you could plead and get 20 or you could take a chance and do life. You know, what do you want to do? And he goes, all right, I'll take the 20. So he, he took 20. Hey, players, this is the end of part one. ATF agent Chris Bayless and the mission to combat violent gun crime. We've got a lot of good stuff coming up in part two, dropping on Thursday. In the meantime, go check us out, patreon.com slash game of crimes. We've got over 80 pieces of content, new stuff coming out all the time. You have to check us out. Some of our episodes, you can't make this shit up in 911. What's your emergency? Really has been a big hit with all of our players. So go check us out there. Also, go check out our webpage, gameofcrimespodcast.com. We've got our merch list there. We've got our book list there as well. Anybody who's been on the show that's written a book, we highlight it and feature it there. Also, go check us out on the socials at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook, and the Instagram. So stay tuned, everybody. Part two ATF agent Chris Bayless and the mission to combat violent gun crime coming up next. <laughs>